Conspiracy. Synchronicity. Sasquatch. Homunculus. Alien races. Satanism in Hollywood. MK Ultra. Tartaria. There's like a whole. I've been watching this one guy. Close like, the door, in. Jury. In. Close your door. What's the uh, inner earth disagreements? Ghost Dad. <laughs> I like that movie. Dogman. Bohemian Grove. Corey Feldman. Feldman. Magicians are demons. Specters. And spirits. Spooks. Summonings. Sleep paralysis. Paralysis. Strange disappearances. Sky whale phenomena. Yes. Alternative history. Shadow people. Shh, quiet. I'm trying to say words with the mouth. It's getting dicey out there. Poltergeists. That's cool. Anunnaki. What is the moon? <laughs> Elf towers. I would never talk about it. That's old. Y2K. Cover ups. Apocalyptic catastrophe. Vampire. Well, hello, hello. Hi. Hello. We have a very special episode for you guys today that we're super excited about. Today we are presenting an episode that is a crossover with a great show, good friends of ours from Expanded Perspectives, Kyle and Cam. Yes. If you guys haven't heard of them, they're a very similar show to us, and we got together to do a kind of round table of strange stories of the unexplained. And it was tons of fun. You guys are going to love it. Check them out at expandedperspectives.com uh, and you can find links to them in the show notes. Yeah, if you like our personality, you're going to love this show. These Absolutely. Guys are, are our new best friends. Yes. <laughs> Give them a listen. Give them a listen, guys. All right. Links in the show notes. Go check them out. And now enjoy the show. Well, thank you guys so much for coming on the show. Kyle Cam of Expanded Perspectives. Yes, and thanks for having us. This is a dream come true. Yeah, this is awesome. This collaboration is going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, it is. We have been juggling it around, so I'm glad we got it worked out. (laughs) Yes, it's been a long time coming. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. But I've been very excited. Uh, It's interesting because I I don't I think our ages are slightly different. But do you guys remember the show? Are you afraid of the dark? Are you familiar with that? I believe so. Yeah, I think I remember that. About a group of kids who would go into the night, into the woods, and yeah. tell scary stories together. Submitted for your approval of the Midnight Society. Oh, right. Yeah. Is what they would say. Around a campfire. You know, they blow, you know, magic fairy dust on the fire and explode. <sighs> this monkey bone dust, wasn't it or something? It was, uh, well, it's actually like a podium, to be technically. Oh, we only right. know that because our dad is a biology yeah, teacher. well. And had access. That's not what they said. Monkey bone dust. Is that what you're saying? I thought it was monkey dust or something. Whatever it was, it was awesome. And I always wanted friends like that. And we had great friends growing up when we would do all kinds of things in the woods, but we never had a campfire to go to, to share strange and creepy stories. So this was kind of an awesome. We do now. It only took us 25 some years to get it, but you guys are here. Yes. And I'm excited. I'm excited. This is going to be fun, man. I, I, some of the stories you guys had sent us, uh, we've already listened to, and it was, it was really interesting. So I'm, I'm looking forward to getting into it. Oh, absolutely. You guys sent great stories as well. We have a fantastic lineup of uh, just freaky, bizarre. I have, a, I have a special favorite of yours coming up that uh, I'll, I'll mention when we get to it. Yeah, but. I'm especially excited for this because we do Strange Listener Stories episodes on the regular pretty much. Um, we try to rotate them in every few episodes, but this one is exciting because it's such a variety of strange so I'm really pumped about that. Yeah. And real quick for our audience, guys, uh, do you want to give just a little like, hey, what's up, who we are and what we do from Expanded Perspectives? Yeah, absolutely. I'm Kyle Filson and he's Cam. Say hi, Cam. Hey, hi, Cam. And we're two <laughs> lifelong friends that live in Texas and we've been podcasting for over a decade now. Uh, I first met this knucklehead when I was in middle school <laughs> and he was one of the first guys I found that also had a love in the paranormal. Uh, at that time, we had no idea it would turn into something like this. But here we are all those years later and uh, we get paid to do it. So it's even, even better. Yeah, man, absolutely. You know, even before we started the show, Belief Hole, by the way, is what it's called. Check it out. We always knew we were going to be doing something together. And we've all had journeys, our own journeys into the strange and unusual personal experiences that led us down different paths of fascination, and interest in different unexplained topics. And that's why we love telling these stories. Yeah. And what I love about the show is it allows us to collect these kinds of stories like you guys. And then we get to tell them with cinematic storytelling and immersive sound design, like in the stories you'll hear tonight. And we get to work with each other, three brothers. (laughs) (laughs) There's just so many crazy topics out there. It's like every day is is a new chapter of strangeness to get into. That's what's exciting about the show is we'll never run out of things to uncover and explore. Yeah. And what I've learned from podcasting is I went into it originally looking for answers and I've only come away with more questions. And boy, absolutely, there is some strange sightings that I'd never heard about in books or saw on television shows like In Search Of or Unsolved Mysteries. There's just oh, yeah. crazy things out there. And one thing I've learned, people aren't alone. If you have a strange experience, you're not alone. Chances are someone else has had a very similar experience. And the number of experiences 
is way higher than I ever thought possible. Right on. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel the same exact way. It just, I, I came into this a little bit more skeptical than us. <laughs> and just the amount of listener stories that we get of people that have had the most bizarre experiences, they just seem so credible and they're with their emotions. And it's just shocking yeah. to hear how many people have had wild experiences. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. When we started the show, you know, we all grew up watching In Search of, you know, Leonard Nimoy. Mystery. Yeah, you named the two that like, yeah. Yeah, Sightings with, um, uh, what was his name? Tim White. Tim White with Sightings. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was a 90s one. But, but there are so many stories that I wasn't expecting when we started getting stories from our listeners. And we're going to touch on some of those tonight, actually, because uh, you guys sent one that was mind blowing to me. The whole, um, whether you call it a uh, duende or, or Vitra from Norway, but the little person phenomenon, the gnome type characters, like that's one of the most common things that come into our uh, story archive. The, so the bizarre ones, the, the little one offs you think, like I definitely open minded to, to ghosts and totally believe in extraterrestrial visitation and out of body experiences, having had one. Well, but all these things, but then, yeah, when you start a show, you start to get an audience and they start to submit and you're like, oh man, this world is, is way more bizarre. Yeah. And it's not just in one area either. What's interesting is yeah. you get sightings of similar things, not just currently, but back through time and all over the globe, no matter where they're at, each culture yes. from different areas, they all have the same story. So how can somebody in Portugal have the same experience as somebody in Colombia or in Canada or, and not just last week, but you know, 400 years ago, they were doing cave paintings of the same to win these, these faith exactly. folk, you know, it's very interesting. How can they all collectively be made up by people for all yeah. these generations? I just don't believe yeah. that's possible. No, I don't either. The, the constant, I think, skeptic argument is get, well, these are all just archetypes that our ancestors right. developed because I should be afraid of small human looking things or, you know, yeah. I, I, th- I get the argument, but it just, t- to me, especially with the, the, I think the veracity of some people's witness testimony where they just, some people are broken by some of this stuff. It just changes yeah, yeah. their life completely. And it makes you realize that there is something greater. I think we're just in a time of forgetting. I think back a long time ago, people just looked at a lot of this stuff as natural. And we're, we've become so entrenched in technology. Materialism. And just moved away from the more finer energies in the universe. Yeah. And I think we're now just starting to kind of rediscover a lot of that stuff. Well, yeah, yeah, we're just, we're foolish as a species. I mean, even right now, we know that solar flares and things like that are real things that not only will happen, but when they happen, and yet we're converting everything to digital. We know right. if something big like that happens, <laughs> right. it's over. Yeah. And I think people, I think they don't like to believe in stories like that because it kind of scares them. And what I yeah. mean is we like to pretend Unknown. we know everything, right? In reality, we don't know anything. Exactly. You know, even if you go to Scandinavia today, like if they're trying to build a road or a highway, they'll go around certain boulder fields because they're afraid of, you know, making oh, angry yeah. the, the little people. Exactly. Well, it's, it's fascinating to me and to echo what all of you're saying in general, when you were mentioning the, um, the veracity, but also not just that, that makes me just blew my mind when we started doing research into a lot of this phenomena, but specifically whether it's Duende or, or Vitra or um, what's the Cherokee? Um, oh, the, uh, the sharp, sharp toothed little folk. Yeah. We covered when there's specific characteristics and attributes about like the uh, red hat um, is one popular one from Scandinavia, but also there's, I forget which tribe has the red uh, hat. I think was actually Sc- Scottish. Was it Scottish? I think anyway, but there's a, a North American tribe that has a similar description with, with the red hat dipped in blood, but it's like, how do you get a population of people separated by, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles of ocean and time telling the same story of the same specific detail. That to me is, is uh, food for thought. Yeah, absolutely. It's impossible. That's the answer. Is yeah. there's something going on? People talk about now, even if you take enough psychedelics, there's these stories mm-hmm. of the machine elves and st- yes. yeah. all these sightings are very similar. They may have different names based on the region they're in, but they're they're the same. So people are experiencing these things. Absolutely. And we have a story like that today, I believe. Should we start with that one oh, just we because we've been kind of down that rabbit hole? Sure. I had a, like a little fun set list, but we can just totally mix it up and kind of randomize it. Maybe the universe is telling us to do it. Expanded perspectives, you guys cool with that? Absolutely. All right. Put some logs on the fire, John. Hi, my name is Marcos. And this is a story of a sighting of little people that my younger brother had in Mexico. It was around the mid to late 2000s. He was walking back from school. He had to go to school 
a long way from home. It was an evening, like around three or four in the afternoon. He had to stay late for after school activities. And once he got out of school, he decided to take the long way home. He had to go through a forested area. Once in the forested area, he decided to uh, just listen to nature while walking and enjoying the moment. But once he heard the bird singing wasn't the same, it changed. It sounded like it was a person or it, it sounded fake. He looked around. He thought he was going to get a uh, rod because he was in Mexico. He thought he was going to be attacked by highwaymen, basically. Once he heard that, he decided to run. He ran as far and as fast as he could. Once he couldn't run anymore, he decided to start walking again. And... Uh, like a minute had passed and he had passed by some trees. He heard again that weird whistling, which sounded fake. He looked up, up at the tree as he was going by it and saw a little person or a duende as they call it in Mexico. He described it basically as Dobby from the Harry Potter series. And it was the size of a cereal box. So it was small and it was wearing a loincloth. And uh, once they, their eyes met, the duende basically dove into the tree branch and just disappeared. Once he saw that, he once again started running. And again, he ran out of breath, stopped running and continued walking. He kept watching behind him and saw that he was being followed by that uh, duende. He could tell that it wasn't concealing completely his presence. It was just occasionally jumping from bush to bush or branch or branches in the tree line and he just was behind him not super close but still behind him my brother was of course scared and just continued walking because he couldn't do anything else so he he eventually reached a stream he decided to jump across the stream it wasn't a big a river or anything it was it was a stream because it was a forested with rural area eventually where he reached the little person or duende did not jump the stream he stayed on the other side of the of that uh, waterway but he would still be able to perfectly conceal himself within seemingly impossible bunches of grass or bushes which my brother could tell were much smaller than the duende uh, he did not question it he just kept walking and never went back to that place again he would take the other ways around to go home or or the bus even. But uh, that was my younger brother's experience in Mexico with duendes. Thank you for your time. Have a good one. Fascinating account. Thank you guys for sharing that. You guys brought this to the table tonight. What an interesting story. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah. Uh, the, the stories of the duendes are very cool. We've had people send in other stories over the years of being out uh, building a house like out in the woods and they would notice that they would leave their tools there overnight when they would come back. <laughs> there would be some of their tools missing, like little screwdrivers, nuts yes. and bolts. And one of the guys claims that he started looking into it more and he came in there and surprised three little duende like creatures stealing tools and they ran off. At first he thought they were raccoons but then he quickly realized that they weren't raccoons that these were in fact little tiny humanoids man it's so crazy because it, it's exactly like what we were just talking about with the crossover of, of cultural connections the vitra, right yeah we had a submission i think last year maybe it was last year the year before but it was this girl from i think she was in norway sweet i think it was sweden, it was a sweden but she was talking about vitra in this the story in her family but she had had an experience with the same thing with in the barn, tools being taken and then a hammer specifically, a hammer specifically. And then um, the braiding of the hair of the horse's mane was always a thing, apparently, in that in that culture. But just the same crossover of the strange. And I, one other thing I was going to say quickly was the water stuck out to me. The stream where he did, wouldn't go over the stream it just reminds me of a few of those stories of little people that we've had submitted. There was always like a water barrier like they would see them on the edge there was an uh s someone's grandfather who had seen them on the other edge of this river and they were having some sort of celebration on the beach there by the forest by the tree line but there was the, the whole water thing and we yeah did that episode on spiritual architecture that goes more into the supernatural aspect of it a little right. bit but the idea that water itself can be a barrier i mean you go back to the scandinavian lore of the uh the hagstone which is basically a, a kind of stone that protects you from magic spells 
because it's a stone that's worked by the water in the river and worn down to become this kind of smooth stone. But there is this connection to whether it's fairy folk or uh, even more supernatural elements that there is some sort of protection with water yeah. or the, the, the breaking down of magic. So if these, I don't know, I mean, this is maybe a stretch, maybe but he just didn't want to get wet. Maybe he didn't possible. want to get wet. That's all, always <laughs> a possibility. I mean, I wouldn't if I'm wearing a loincloth only, but it's a possibility <laughs> that there is that kind of barrier that maybe if they are potentially multidimensional, they can transfer between worlds. Maybe the water is this kind of barracks. We hear all the time about marshes and lowlands that are kind of a hotbed for supernatural experiences or paranormal run-ins, if you will. And it seems like that's kind of a magical area. It's a magnet. I don't know. That's just me spitballing. But Yeah, well, the other thing to me that's always funny about these stories is that we forget the older Fae stories aren't kind. These things that's true. <laughs> they're not nice. They're not here to be playful. Nothing is nice about them. They are tricksters and they're out to get you. And it's right funny on, yeah. how we have romanticized this idea yeah. almost to where now they're little yard gnomes and they're here to help and they're yeah. this and that. And we get stories to where they look like that, but you never get a lot of stories or even if any, where they're helpful. No. It's always <laughs> right. they either react like, oh my gosh, I can't believe they can see me. And then they're yes. gone. Or it's some sort of mischievous intent in everything yeah. that they do like it's something i bring up all the time is it's almost like they feed off of your emotions when you react to them oh yeah that's a great point yeah we make that a point a lot i don't know if we've yeah. talked about that in relation to um this phenomenon exactly but we always talk about the fear eater the nightmare feeder the the multi-layer of phenomena that seem to just want your reaction your dog man's a great example of that a lot of those stories mm -hmm. anyway where they could easily do something to you but they don't they don't. But they're eating that fear, yeah. but they do do something. And that thing is to draw that fear out of you. And yeah, the same with shadow beings. All of these things seem to be feeding like, and that always lends me back to the same thing is all of this seems to stem from Fay. It yeah. seems to be coming from one general area. Now you may get different reactions and different creatures or beings or anything like that. And then you get this. I am fascinated with the stories of the Fay, the sightings of the little people. The whole thing, because to me, that's one of those deals. It's hard to hide an eight foot tall biped, right? In all the woods, <laughs> right. it has to be in certain areas, certain things like it, it, it's one of those deals. But if this thing is six inches tall, how many times have you walked by them? If they're really there, how exactly. easy would it be to walk by? Yeah, especially if they're so good at camouflage. Yes. And you, don't, you also don't hear a lot of stories of about an eight foot tall biped appearing in your bedroom at night. No, but we do get a lot of these stories where we've had a, we had a great story where uh, something came through the flower pot in someone's room. Oh, right. Yeah. Uh, but it just marked this person for the rest of their lives. They were just uh, affected by it forever. And it's always the same description of this small entity that has a ruddy face. It's always a ruddy, almost dirty face. At least the ones we've gotten from listeners. Yeah. And it just, it's weird because it goes back to like, I mean, it, the, the guy who coined the term gnomes was a guy by the name of Paracelsus. We covered him on the, um, I think the Terrors by Gnomes episode, but uh, he was like a chemist and scientist. He was a traveling worldly intellectual, essentially, in Europe way back. I forget what, what century, but um, he coined the term gnome and he believed, I think his father actually was worked underground or something and did kind of spurn the idea of Tommy knockers and these things that live below us. But there's so many stories where they, they either come up from underground or they have this kind of dirty faces, this presence like they can cross between the earth multiphasal. Yeah, if, whether it's that's a word, other but. dimensional or just, you know, coming up from underground, I'm sure it, may be, it might be. It sounds like it's both. Regardless, it's just fascinating. Yeah. And I was going to touch on your point there about everything leads back to the fade. It reminds you of, you, you, I'm sure you guys are familiar with the, the ultra terrestrial idea. Yes. John Keel. So it reminds you of that too. Like, is it an overarching trickster? Could it all be the same sort of, not, maybe not everything, but it seems like so many things that seemingly are so different fall into the same, like, just when you almost get a picture just when this and that there's like a trickster element to it you know it's, it's interesting it's all very interesting yeah they always warn you not to partake in the drink or the food of the fae right. if they offer you something do not accept it especially children you know which kind of kind of blends over into maybe like boogeyman stories yeah. and that and the myth of that the same thing the changelings the things like yes. that it always made me wonder you remember the old travelocity commercials well their icon was a gnome <laughs> That's and right. it always made me wonder, like, what are they talking about traveling to? Like, why did they choose? <laughs> yeah, yeah, they are yeah. the best travelers. <laughs> yeah, very bizarre, Great right? Point. Just not where you want to go. Yeah. Well, to switch up gears here, uh, I want to do this next story if you guys are up for it. This is a, a really unique story we had submitted to us by Hansi Driscoll. Hansi Driscoll, which I believe is an alias, but uh, this is a great tale. Yeah. I call this Scared Skate. 
Which is a playoff of Scared Straight, right? Because it's a scary story, but hilarious. It's a warning. Please, John, if you would initiate. Hello, Belief Hole. When I was younger, I was part of the skateboard industry, and I lived in San Francisco in the 90s and was sponsored by Adrenaline Skateboards. Years later, I was talking with my friend Dan about the craft that I saw in the sky that disappeared into four rings like a flash in the sky. It looked like as if you would drop four pebbles equally spaced apart into water and the rings rippling outward was what the pattern made in the sky. And he looked down and got serious and he told me this story. He said he was leaving his apartment one day and he lived at the top of the hill so he got to skate down the hill fast. He said that there was a bum standing there right when he got out of his apartment and he said, I see you covered in blood. And Dan was like, damn, that's creepy. You know, he's thinking that's creepy. And so he uh, he's like, whatever. And so he jumps on his board and drops in this hill. And in San Francisco, you can time the lights. So when you're at the top of the hill and the light just turned red for you going down the hill, by the time you got to the bottom, it would be green. So he drops in on this hill. And he said it was about three blocks that he would do this skate run down. And he said he was three blocks down the hill, hauling butt. And he said he looked over and there was the same bum standing there on the corner. I think he said he was looking at him and he said, he was so freaked out because it was absolutely impossible for this same guy to just reappear because Dan, it was literally just, you know, 30 seconds later, 45 seconds later, and Dan was hauling butt on his skateboard. So he was so freaked out, he didn't know what to do. He did a four wheel slide to slow down, jumps off his skateboard, instead of going through the green light. Right then, a car zooms through its red light, running the red light, and if Dan would have gone through that green light, he would have been absolutely ran over by this super fast car. He said that he picked up his board and just walked all the way to work and was absolutely freaked out and didn't know what to think of it. When he was telling me the story, he was not stoked, looked shaken up and scared. And I'll never forget Dan telling me that story. Who knows what that was? Some type of guardian angel type event or who knows? Anyways... I love you guys and keep up the good work. Thank you, Hansy. Thank you, Hansy Driscoll. Man, I love that story. Yeah, it's cool. You know, we've had um, listeners write in with stories very similar. Like for whatever reason, they go to travel the same way on a particular road every day to work. And then for one whatever reason, they wake up that morning and they just have this feeling that they just need to take a different route. They take that other route. And then moments later, there was like a catastrophe at one of the intersections. And they believe yeah. that they don't even know what, but something intervened. They don't know if it's a, a past loved one that's sending them messages. If it is, in fact, you know, angels, a guardian angel. You hear these stories all the time and it makes you wonder, like, what did the guy see? What kind of premonition? Was it truly extraterrestrials helping him out? Or was it something else that he saw in the heavens, not UFOs? Right. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. That actually reminds me of uh, was it Jimi Hendrix. What was the one there was? Some, oh, yeah. What you said reminded me of that. It was like a celebrity paranormal. And what was the one? I, yeah, I forget the researcher, but basically he had collected accounts. Uh, Jimi Hendrix and the band had broken down traveling from New York, I believe, New York out in the sticks. And there was a snowstorm that came in and they got stuck in the snow. And according to Jimmy, 
there was a craft that came down. Actually, it wasn't Jimmy. It was his friend, bandmate, that told the story to this researcher. But this craft came down and this triangular headed being came out and melted the snow. <laughs> it's very strange. And I don't know if he was a fan or what, but he <laughs> allowed them to leave this, you know, New York back road yeah. out in the woods. And then they were all allegedly changed by this experience. I think the guy's name was Chris. I'll have to look that up. But, but yeah, I think there are, whether it's E.T. or Guardian Angel, I think uh, it sounded like Hansy. I think he was kind of putting two stories into one there. Um, but fascinating. I just feel like, you know, sometimes we're just not done here. And like, it, for whatever reason, these beings show up and there's just more in your life that needs to be finished. And yeah, maybe helping people out. Yeah, I think that we all have souls and they go on, in my opinion, forever. And this place is hard to be sometimes on earth. And if there's work that needs to be done here, sometimes guardian angels or whatever you want to call them come into uh, action if they need to, to make sure that you, you finish what you need to do here. Yeah. It actually brings up real quick that, uh, what did you refer to earlier? Chris was the, um, the third man oh, yeah. theory, which I don't think that necessarily applies, but I think it is. I'm going to butcher it because I'm, I'm, this is all from memory. But when I was listening to the story before, it reminded me of the idea of something, and maybe you guys are familiar with this. Maybe you can correct me on this. There's something about, I think it's called the third man, but the idea that there are moments in life where you are in uh, dire straits, you're in a deadly situation and something outside of you takes over, but takes over your body and does something. For example, pulls the wheel in the car just before a semi truck comes out and cuts you off. But you didn't make that decision, at least not that you're aware of. So whether it's an extra sensory perception or whether there's something that's, you know, with you all the time outside of your consciousness, like another l higher layer of consciousness yeah. that is observing everything at all times. It's way out there. But it when you said that, it reminded me of the uh, the simulation theory. And the right. idea that, like, I always think of that. Yeah. We're just we're players and we're being played by a, like a, a larger consciousness that may take over and act in a way that saves us from, I mean, that's definitely not necessarily this case, but I just thought that's an interesting, interesting concept. Yeah, no, it's, you're not wrong. It's the third man factor. There you go. I, I do, you know. <laughs> There's an excellent set of books written by a guy named John Geiger. Hey, writing that down. John Geiger, G-E-I-G-E-R. Okay. He has one, I think the other one's called The Angel Effect, but his first book, The Third Man Factor, it's, it's specifically on this. And he's got all kinds of stories in there where there's guys on one of the first guys to climb Mount Everest. He swears that, you know, he was starting to feel tired. He didn't want to keep going. And then out of the blue, uh, another climber showed up. And he kept him, kept him awake, kept him moving, kept him pressing. And like three or four days later when he got down, he said the whole time this guy was with him. And when he got down to the bottom, he turned around. He wanted to thank the guy and there was no one there. Yeah, and he's like, I amazing. know the guy was there. He was with me for days. That's crazy. Uh, famous cases like Shackleton and stuff down in Antarctica and stuff. He talks about at night oh, yeah. in storms, he could look up and see uh, a sailor steering the ship That's every awesome. night. And if that mysterious sailor hadn't have been there, they would have been lost, you know. But he would, they, yeah. and several people saw it. We have help down here. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So sure. You pointed out that it might be, you know, other souls, you know, as we go on and go on forever, it could be us coming back to help others here. Maybe mm -hmm. that's the work that you have to do when you leave here to make amends right, or could, penance. You absolutely. come back and you have to save some others when and where you can. Pay it forward. Yeah, the simple spook explanation I had was very similar to that, but the idea of like, what if, what if this homeless man, for whatever reason, had... Oh, that was an interesting theory too. What if he had been killed on this road, maybe even at that intersection, and he was aware in this other state of being that this was going to happen? And maybe he does this from time to time, helps out people that are going to be killed in the same spot. You know I what I mean? I see you covered in blood. He could do it less creepy. He could do it less creepy. Well, that was, that <laughs> was my voice, be a be lot fair. less <laughs> nefarious the way he... It wasn't actually him. <laughs> maybe it was the skater, his older self. He becomes a homeless man Ooh, later in life. And I like that. And yes, old time travel. Yeah, yeah. Ooh, the paradox. We had a fascinating story. Uh, I'll summarize real quick, but it was a listener who wrote in a, a few listener stories episodes ago. Basically, she had always seen in, in the house, it was known to have this creepy lady that would look in the window at night, oh, this yeah. phantom -y figure. And then years later, she had a dream and had totally forgotten about that. She had a dream that she was looking through her childhood home's window as an older woman. Then she saw her and her sister playing in there. Then she saw herself and her sister look at the window and freak out. She woke up and remembered that she would always see this figure in the window. And she thought, was somehow I projecting back in time through dream a dream walking. state? Yeah, dream, dream walking. walking. Yeah, what a fascinating idea. Yeah. Well, we're the ones that invented time. That, right, exactly. Yeah, that's true. If we could throw all that out and actually live our lives without it, there's no telling what else we could find. Right. Everything <laughs> atemporal, that'd be nice. Have mm -hmm. you guys gone down the rabbit hole of near-death experiences? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, every 
every person that's ever experienced one talks about there's no time on the other side. Right. It's the outside it's of time. It's definitely a human construct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 That's the, the idea of reality or one of the theories, I guess, of reality is that everything has happened or is happening all at the same time. And we experience it in a linear fashion so we can make sense of it, learn from challenges and mistakes, operate within it. Right. But that's specifically connected to this reality and in our incarnation here. But yeah, any hoodly do. <laughs> Should we move on to another story? Sure, Flanders. Let's bring it up to uh, this next story. Um, this this ties into a phenomenon that I think for me is the is the most bizarre, the most um, unexpected. Oh, I know where you're going. As far as stories that uh, we've had a ridiculous amount of people write in about this specific phenomenon. Actually, we did an episode. It's the phenomena of disembodied hands. <laughs> And I don't know if you guys are, how many stories you guys may have received, but we have an odd number of these disembodied hand stories that we just did. We did an episode the first time we did one that had a listener story about it. We probably had like at least dozens of people writing in their own accounts of witnessing disembodied hands. Yeah, we've experienced the same thing. It's, it's remarkable. You know, it's kind of iconic, even in movies of like a hand coming up from the yeah. bed. It makes you wonder. Because of the people seeing the movies, is that's what inspired them to have that? Or is there something more to it? But yeah, we've experienced the same thing. Lots of people have written in about these hands that they see it's under crazy. the bed or monsters under the bed. It kind of it kind of goes into the, the whole, like, again, back to the Fae or the boogeyman and stuff. Like, what are, why are these children seeing? And why are children more prone to seeing it than adults? It's like right. the magic kind of goes open. away. Yeah. You know, when it comes to like poltergeist activity, it's almost always like teenage girls for some reason. Mm -hmm. They have more yeah. experiences than teenage boys. And it almost never happens when you get to adulthood. Yeah, I often wonder if it's because you're, you know, whether you believe you come from somewhere before this, which I do, wherever that may be. But I feel like you're you're closer to the other side initially, the earlier you are in this world. Yeah. So you're, you're closer to that veil. Well, and modernity and education just beats it out of us, too. Like, That's true. None of this can be real. We live in a very materialistic mm -hmm. reality. Yeah. Anyways, that's the setup for this story. Uh, <laughs> this is called The Hand from Under the Bed, and this comes from Eric. Hello, guys. My name is Eric Yahoo. This took place in 1971 when I was four years old. My sister was eight. We lived in a two-bedroom small apartment with my mother and what I believed to be my father living there at the time, although they were separated. Now, a little backdrop is that both of them were heavily into drugs, which, of course, I wasn't aware of, and very much alcoholics. So we realize that this can open up portals and gateways. And hurt people, especially innocents. And so my sister, who was eight and I was four, we were sharing this bed. And one morning I woke up and saw this green, scaly-like hand. Now, there was no internet, and I wasn't into horror movies at four years old, so I didn't have a frame of reference. But looking back, that's what it was. It was this green kind of scaly, almost a typical demon hand with the very sharp nails coming up from the side of the bed that was pushed all the way against the wall. And, of course, I jumped and probably screamed. And my sister woke up and saw it and she screamed and we jumped off the bed and my parents came rushing in. And as we went to point, of course, it was gone. So it's short and sweet. Many things happened after that, more of the human kind of demons than supernatural. But those are different stories for a different time. We appreciate everything that you guys do. And I hope that people find solace in knowing that they're not alone. And they're not crazy. The world is a very supernatural place. And not everything that you see is what's real. Remember, the world is much greater than we can possibly imagine. Thanks, guys. Bounding success in all that you do. We will talk to you later. I have many other stories. But that one scared the heck out of me when I was a kid. And I still remember it to this day. I could almost draw it perfectly. Well said, Eric. Frightening. Yeah, I guess uh, looking back on that, it may not have been disembodied. It just came up from That's true. the side of the bed. Yeah. I totally misspoke. I totally set up that story incorrectly. How dare you? 
Well, they didn't see a body, so in theory... There yeah. you go. I'm still right. <laughs> still right. Still correct. Crazy. Well, I think might have jumped out of the disembodied hand thing because several of the ones we covered were, it was following these, this pattern of green skin, not yes. always scaly, but green skin, hairy, very hairy hands, long black hairs, disembodied hands. Yeah, just bizarre. Yeah, I was going to say, it makes you wonder if, because of the circumstances in the household, if that didn't somehow manifest this. What I mean is, yeah. the children the, were terrified. Their parents were alcoholics and drug abusers, probably right. wasn't a very stable or good home to grow up in. And it's almost like whatever this is, I'm just going to say the word demon. I don't know what it is. It's like it's, fe- it's it can feed yep. off the pain and sorrow of that house. We and just it, talked about this. Mm-hmm. That it can draw some kind of energy from those children by frightening them, you know, because it never totally reveals itself, just only the hand. And you have a vulnerable child. Mm-hmm. So it's real yeah. easy to get into that yes. child's psyche and actually ingrain yourself with it. Yeah, it's low-hanging fruit. I yes. Think. You have the mix of the youth and traumatic kind of environment which Mm -hmm. just seems like a perfect breeding ground it really is there's so many stories i'm sure you guys experienced this too so many stories we get are people who are that grow up in a home like this where there's a lot of unsettled emotion there's uh fighting tragedy trauma of some kind and it just seems like the entities of this sort are drawn to this because like you said it is it is a kind of um i don't know perfect storm a low-hanging fruit to, to draw that energy and feed off of it yeah. yeah, that's one of the reasons I, I'm hesitant to go to anywhere that's super haunted, especially by super dark things, because yeah. I feel like they're going to see me and be like, oh, he's easy. <laughs> this guy. Low hanging fruit, Chris. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so <laughs> he's I so scared. I get, I'm a worrisome fella. Well, sometimes. that's what we joke about all the time is like you could go to a haunted place and you don't know what's going to attach itself to you or right. any of your belongings. Right. Or you could go to the woods and you know Bigfoot's not in the back of your car. Right. When you get in there <laughs> and look behind you, you're like, well, he's not back there, so we're good. He's not coming home with me. There's nothing creepy going to happen. Yeah, great point. He's yeah. not Harry and the Henderson fitting himself no, in the back seat. No, <laughs> no. I should ask you guys real quick, because I know you guys you guys hunt and you're in the woods a lot. Do you, oh, yeah. do you ever done any Bigfoot stuff out there, or have you had any strange experiences outside of that? I can. I wouldn't say we've gone and done it like direct. Yeah. It's always while we're out there, you're always keeping an eye on it and always looking and trying and thinking, you know, did I hear right. this? Did, you know, what's going on? No, I've never had anything Bigfoot related ever. No yeah. knocks, no whistles, no sound, no tracks. Oh, I, you know, we found some strange things in the woods, you know, as far as broken and twisted trees at certain right. heights, things like that. But, I mean, to keep an open mind, it could literally be anything. It could have been a little, you know, some wind. It could have been all kinds of stuff. I'm not there to see it. That's yeah. about the extent of the strangeness that I've had ever. Yeah, I'm the same way. I've never experienced anything <laughs> Bigfoot related while out hunting. Now, you know, there's a bunch in our county. Like there's stuff that's gone on within three miles of where we're living right now. Oh, wow. Really? And I know several people I've hunted with in the past that have had odd experiences. Oh, yeah. But, you know, we joke about it on our show all the time is when you ask me about Bigfoot, it depends on what day of the week you ask me. Because there's days where I'm like, oh, it's definitely real. The next day I wake up, I'm like, it's impossible. It can't be real. (laughs) How can something that large be living in the, you know, the Mogollon Rim? You know, it just doesn't make any sense. But then two days later, I'll hear another story or I'll meet a listener and they tell me a heartfelt story from an old person. There's no reason even to make it up. They don't even listen to podcasts. And why are so many people seeing it all over? So, again, universal. It doesn't matter if it's the skunk ape or the grass man where you live, whether it's, you know, an almosty, no matter where you go, orang pendek, they have different names for them, but it's the same thing. How can so many cultures have the same descriptions? Exactly. And and what you're talking about when you talk about, like, you hear a heartfelt story from a listener and and when there's corroboration between multiple people, it will all seem very genuine and sometimes don't want to, don't want their names out there. It's like, how can you discount all these? And I often think like, is it the case that these are, it goes back to whether a faith thing or an ultra terrestrial idea. I know people are very divided on that, but I sometimes I can't think of it being any other sort of thing except for some sort of, or even if they're just highly adept at camouflaging themselves because they've, if you want to go the more material route. But either way, like it's hard for me to, I'm, but I'm with you where I'll be, I'll go through periods of time where like, I don't know, because it's, you know, it's been so long since there's been hard evidence, but then you get these accounts where you're like, I can't dismiss this person's account. Yeah. They're so genuine. Well, you touch on a great point for me personally, which is, I often say like, God, I just want to see a dog, man. No, you don't. And I know, I know I don't. I know in reality I don't, but there is something to researching stuff for so long and, you know, armchair researching and not being out in the field and not having my own experiences where you, I almost get jealous of, I don't, obviously. You want to start with dog, man. I know. It's just, that was was kind of my fascination at the time, but I want to see something so extraordinary. And I, I think I have experienced things like that, but I think, and this is, I think an argument against skepticism in general for some of these stories. I think that 
the first thing people do when they experience something strange or, or um, inexplicable is your mind goes to what could that be? You know, mm-hmm. and we, I think that people don't get enough credit to witnesses where the first thing you do think of is like, it's a bear or it's something we're going to figure this out. It's not, it's not Bigfoot. It's not a ghost. The first thing any human generally does is try to explain it away because every time I've experienced something, that's what I do. But I think that the experiences that linger, obviously the ones that are so, you can't deny it. I mean, that these people witness something. Some people are so broken, they won't go hunting anymore and they've done it their whole lives. Yeah. Um, it definitely affects people. Yeah. Yeah. We say all the time on the show, like whether the person really saw what they think they saw or they just imagined it, the effect on them is exactly the same. So it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. They're forever changed based on their experience, whether it was physical or not. Very true. So to argue whether they saw what they think they saw or not is kind of ridiculous. And I also, I think it's foolish for people to, you've met them that are just dead set on it's absolutely 100% impossible. I'm like, so how can you be so sure? Yeah. Right. I think of it like this too, is I'm colorblind. So I already don't perceive the world the way other people do. So how do I know you don't have some sort of way of perceiving something at a certain frequency that I can't? Great point. Yeah. There's so many things outside of our ability to visualize or auditory. Yeah. We got a very limited amount of senses. Yeah. We have a Bigfoot story, don't we? We do. But yeah, we'll do that next. That's actually, it's their story. You guys, this story is amazing. Yeah, do you guys want to set this up? This is this is a pretty incredible story. Yeah, this is uh, pretty interesting. Uh, a listener, you can tell he's an older gentleman uh, just by how he seems crotchety, you know, in, in a good way. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great way to describe it, yeah. Oh, man. For him to even figure out the, the ability to call into our show and leave a message is impressive. <laughs> but the fact that he would do that just to make it up, it doesn't seem, again... I don't think people would waste their time to go through that much effort just to pull our leg. You know, what benefit would they yeah. get from pulling our leg yeah. at the end of the day? You can tell this guy believes it for oh, sure. Yeah. Oh yeah. He starts getting into like how they communicate. Now, I don't know if that's correct, but that's his right. theory. Yeah. And that's the idea. I think your, your guys' show is a lot like our show where we, we are open to all ideas and we enjoy discussing these different concepts and we're not beholden to one idea, which I feel like some people are like, you know, well, I'm going to throw this out because it doesn't follow in line with I, what I believe and know to be true. Absolutely. We, we always say it's like a safe space for people with experiences yes you guys want to do it yes let's do it uh yes my name is leo lish i'm 67 years old i live in pocatello idaho about seven years ago i had a sighting while i was an engineer for up railroad i was driving a train one day and as we was going very slow working on restricted speed and my conductor saw something that was out of place he thought it looked like a huge rock but anyway uh, we kept looking at it and it stood up and it walked over a few feet and while it was standing there looking at the train we was only going like seven mile an hour because we was working on restricted speed anyway he asked me to look up and see if i could tell what that was and i looked up at the hill and it was only about 100 yards away and it was standing upright facing the train looking at us and my exact words to my conductor was It looks like a man standing up there. Maybe it's a manager with a radar gun making sure we're going restricted speed because they do that. They test you all the time when you run trains. Anyway, my uh, attention went right back to the track because when you're at restricted speed, you have to watch out for broken rail and stuff like that because if you run over broken rail, you get fired. So anyway, I'm watching with my binoculars the rail to see if there's any damage to the rail. And he said, Leo, what is that thing doing? And I looked out the window with my binoculars, out the train window with my binoculars. It was open, and I put my elbows on the arm pad that's outside the window. And I'm looking right at it, and it it had slipped just over the hill to where only about half of its body was upright over the hill and it was still facing the train and my uh, binoculars are seven power so seven power at 100 yards is like uh, 17 18 yards is what i was actually looking at it right in its eyes and i noticed the first thing i noticed was how the sun was uh, reflecting in its eyes like uh, it would reflect off the eyes of a deer or an elk and uh 
I also noticed what an innocent look it had. It had an innocent look in its eyes, just like deer and elk have when they're feeding and you catch them and they look up and you see the eyes shining and stuff. It had an innocent look to it. And all of a sudden, while I was looking in its eyes, I started getting these thoughts. I started receiving like telepathic messages of some kind. And I started seeing all these formulas of figures. That, I know this sounds crazy, but it happened. And all of a sudden, these thoughts came into my head of of the capabilities of, of this thing's eyesight. The capabilities of a Sasquatch are this from what I learned from the telepathic connection I made with that Sasquatch by looking in its eyes. They can see ultraviolet. They can see infrared. Uh, they can see the electrical signal generated by every living creature. That's why you people fail in getting close. You have to have material that's going to shield anything that has an electrical signal, like a camera or anything like that, because they can see the electrical signal put out by a, a battery pack in a camera or anything. They can see all that. You don't get nothing by them that has any kind of electrical signal, including your body. And there is material made that does block that stuff. So there is a chance that the BFRO, if they wanted to listen to me, instead of like Matt Moneymaker, just, oh, well, you couldn't possibly know the secret of the Sasquatch research. I do. I received it through a telepathic message by looking in the eyes of a Sasquatch. There was no fear in me because uh, most people uh, get afraid when they see him because uh, they're not in a train 14 feet off the ground that a Sasquatch could never get into and get to you. So anyway, this thing turned to leave when it seen it was really quite amazing that your response. It was sitting there looking innocent right in my eyes. And then all of a sudden it saw the little man in the window looking at it. And it was it was just a, a human-like reaction. It was almost like it, it said, oh, wow. And its eyes got big and stuff, and it turned to leave. And when it turned to leave, I seen it had long, wavy hair. Uh, it was it was quite awesome. And it was about eight and a half feet tall and probably weighed six to seven hundred pounds. It was just huge. Anyway, that's my story, and uh, if you'd like to use it, uh, you have, uh, but I have given you the secret, the Sasquatch research. No, I have not given you the secret because I didn't tell you the material that blocks the electrical signals that you need to cover all your equipment in and everything when you research Sasquatch. And this uh, deal of running around with lights and radios is a good way to fail at getting any definite proof of a Sasquatch. You got to do it differently. So, uh, yeah, you can use my story if you want, or you can be like Matt Moneymaker and just throw it off half-handedly like nobody could possibly know uh, nothing more than he knows. <laughs> So, yeah, okay, well. And there it is. And there it is. Yeah. Fascinating story. He does not like Matt Moneymaker. <laughs> yeah, and I don't take any, you know, positions on that because I don't really know Matt. I haven't had any experience with Matt. Oh, um, me either. No, no. But yeah. I believe the guy's sighting is genuine. He didn't seem yeah, to be I a guy too. that would mess around, right? He seems of that era. Yeah, obviously he believes what he saw. There's, no, I don't see any um, ulterior motive. He's just telling something that he saw. I think the, the primary clue of that to me was the specific detail of when he saw this thing and its eyes got big. Oh, the oh, surprise. The surprise oh, yeah. of this animal. Yeah. Of like, oh, it sees me. Whatever it happened to be, he definitely experienced something. Yeah. And I think the aspect of the ESP connection, like it's not that out there considering some of the stories you hear with Sasquatch encounters, Bigfoot encounters, even more out there, outlandish tales. And how many strange things, you know, we've been talking about all kinds of strange things tonight, but how many strange things have that allegation of an extrasensory perception you know whether mm -hmm. it's you know et communication you hear that all the time and how dissimilar are these things really so you, get, you gotta you gotta be open-minded to that for sure yeah and it's an interesting theory he had about them being able to detect electronic fields i mean we know that there so are too. animals that can do that like sharks you know if you look at the lower jaw of a shark they have these little dots that look like big pores and that's the ampullae de lorenzini which detects nice. electromagnetic fields in the water and that's how they can hunt fish in complete darkness oh crazy and then hunters they're starting to experiment with types of camouflage yeah oh yeah like the hex suits 
is a big thing that they've got going on. I don't know oh, if you boys that? have seen that. It's called Human Energy Concealment Systems. <gasps> oh. Really? Yeah. So they it was actually originally invented. They started doing it, I believe, for shark repellent suits. Swimming so with it, them. Yeah, yeah, swimming with it. And they have since pushed it and pushed it to where now they use it for basically all hunting. You can hunt turkey and deer and everything with it. And they have great success with it. That's awesome. Yeah, you can go on YouTube and watch videos of these guys wearing these hex suits. H-E-C-S. Y'all can check that out. So are there Bigfoot hunters? I don't haven't seen any Bigfoot hunters wearing them, but they're just regular hunters. They really? should. They should I be mean, it, it does make a lot of, like, just common sense, I feel like. Is this the secret material he was talking about? Maybe. Well, anything that blocks those kind of signals, I Well, would it would make like. full sense if they really did perceive things that way. It would answer Absolutely. all of our questions. Yeah. It, That's it, the it, reason exactly. we can't find them, is we're telling them where we're coming. Absolutely. It makes so much sense if you think about it in that respect, because, you know, if you something that's been so good at evading our detection for so long, and especially if you're someone who believes in the... 100% material aspect of the Bigfoot phenomena, then you would definitely think absolutely they've evolved into understanding how to hide themselves. And so this, this sort of extrasensory detection, even in this, you know, animalistic way makes total sense to me. And yeah. think about how just humans in general are so dis, I mean, like we, this goes back to what we were talking about earlier. Human beings are so locked into technology. We're just so distracted. Yeah. And we walk into these spaces and we have all of our own electromagnetic frequencies, and then we bring all this equipment. I mean, it just seems like a beacon. It makes oh, total yeah. sense, yeah. Yeah, I think that's why you hear a lot of hunters that go in very minimalist into the into the wild and run into these things versus all the shows you see yeah. <laughs> going out there with like lights and cameras and like, oh, I think I heard one over there, and then you chase it, and then, you know, what are you actually going to experience versus someone who's stealthily or minimalistly going into the, into the wilderness? The thing that always gets me confused about that story is why would it tell Leo how to find it? <laughs> right. He's sending him. Yeah, maybe yeah. it wasn't intentional. That's what maybe I'm it thinking. It was just like a oh. download sort of thing. Yeah, like they locked in, and maybe maybe, maybe even Leo has some sort of extrasensory perception. He's on he, trains by himself a lot. You know, uh -huh. people. He's probably not deep into technology himself. He may be just a more open person. Yeah. It's a fascinating point. Actually, was it Cam or Kyle who just said who made that point? Me, Cam, Cam, me. <laughs> Cam. Exactly. Uh, because it makes me think, um, oh, now I'm laughing. I can't think of what I was saying. Um, uh, bum, 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 bum. <laughs> <laughs> I bring it back. Uh, bu, bu, bu. Oh, yes, exactly, Cam. Because it reminds me of like when, because you're right, I didn't think about this, but at that moment where he said he was getting that download, it wasn't until after that or whatever he described it as, but getting those impressions, the psychic impressions of, you know, formulas and whatnot, or the knowledge about how they see things. It wasn't until after that where, right, where the eyes got big, where they realized he was being seen. And then he yeah. took off. So it's like he was unintentionally allowing that information oh, so to he escape. Realized, realized he leaked it. To yeah. The guy. Oh, he can hear me too. Yeah. <laughs> like, this is not good. Like how many that stories right. do you hear? Like the with, with the Fay folk stories is is like what people see them, then they're like shocked that you can see them. Like uh oh, exactly. he can see me. Yeah. We just did a story like that. Because most can't probably. You know, and that's yeah. almost yeah. what it sounded like he said. And you could tell even when Leo was describing, he was sending him formulas and stuff. He acknowledged, you could tell, they, it sounds ridiculous. He knows it sounds ridiculous. He's like, listen, I know yeah. this sounds right. ridiculous, but this is what was happening. So, so I love right. it when people do that because we've yeah. had people tell us stories and they realize it while they're telling you. They're like, look, I know this sounds crazy, yeah. but this is what I saw. I would exactly. prefer getting a story like that, though. Tell me all the crazy feelings yeah, you felt. Absolutely. absolutely. Don't hide any of it. Exactly. Like if you don't, don't want to talk you think about it, crazy. that's fine. But yeah. at least let me know. I want to know what you felt and were perceiving and feeling at that time. Yeah. Right. It adds such a level of credibility when the person themselves knows how crazy it sounds. Yeah. Because they're obviously not crazy. Well, and as Kyle pointed out, what would be the benefit of him telling this story? Exactly. Right. He had no idea if we were going to use it. For all we know, we would have never even listened to it or we was, you know, he had no he idea. Was He's just sharing. Angry. What? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He was a little angry that Matt Money made. <laughs> oh, yeah, he was. Well, and he may have lost some sleep due to all this for all this whole yeah. time. Oh, I'm like, sure this is something he did. this man's held on to for quite some time. Well, you could yeah. tell he takes his job serious because he thought that was his boss up on the hill radar him and he even right. said, well, you'll, you'll get, get fired, fired yeah. you know? Yeah. So, <laughs> Who knows how that affected his career? Like, I'm yeah. sure he didn't, couldn't keep that to himself and people probably... I'm sure he was looking for it forever after that. Yeah. I had Keeping told an eye out. a story on the show before that a friend of mine from East Texas that I used to work with had shared with me about one of his closest friends who had an encounter out there while fishing with his dad at a lake in East Texas. And it was much like the same thing except it was like a 30 foot encounter they were going around early in the morning before daylight in the bass boat and they were flipping and pitching up against the bank and 
as they're just putting around with the trolling motor. No noise. They're not talking in the front of the boat, the whole deal. And the, the guy that was telling me, you know, he's in the back of the boat. His buddy's in the back of the boat, rather, and his buddy's dad's on the front. And the dad's like, make some noise. He's like, what's that? And they're 30 foot away from the bank. And he said, what looks like a gorilla crouched down by the water, all black, getting a drink or something. said, it looks up and sees them and doesn't know what to do. Like, it's confused, like, what they're doing there. Like, it's a total shock and surprise. This thing stands up, takes a couple of steps, and slips behind a tree. And then starts doing the tree peeking where it's leaning out looking at them. And they both said, look, they're 30, 40 foot from it looking right at it. And this thing is a seven foot tall plus black monkey man is what basically they were describing and they never slowed down they just kept going working the bank they never made any noise they never acted like anything was any different this thing stood there the whole time i guess moved on off the whole deal but yeah it same deal as they had this encounter out of the blue for no reason and the thing is like he's talking about of course they didn't talk about any relaying of information but the same surprised look the same deal is like i cannot believe these guys slipped up on me (laughs) <laughs> right, right. And if you had the ability to see electrical signal, to see infrared, if you could see and perceive things much like the predator, it would be real hard to slip up on something like that. Absolutely. Yeah. And now we're speculating about a speculative animal. So it's yeah, really easy. Right? You can add all <laughs> this stuff because we don't know. Yeah, exactly. We don't know. Expanded we're all looking for answers. Yes. Yes. Expand your perspectives, people. When you expand your perspective, you often fall into the belief hole. That's what I always say. That's exactly what happens. You will trip and fall into it. Well said. Well said. And then you just tumble down it. (laughs) That's right. There's no getting out. No. Like we said, way more questions than answers is what you'll find. Yeah. That's the beautiful part. What's next, Chris? Oh, what is next? Okay. I I really want to do the centaur story. Okay. Oh, my gosh. Expanded Perspectives brought this to us to share today on this crossover episode. And this is one of one of my most favorite stories I've ever heard because it is so unique. Well, it blows my mind. So you guys did an episode on centaurs, mm-hmm. which would not even occur to me, but that's like my favorite kind of thing. Really? Well, yeah, you, well we've talked about... I mean, not centaurs specifically, but just, just the things that you assume are relegated to mythology. And think like we talked all the time about how you know, people used to paint and draw these things or ha- you know, there's mythology and how much of mythology, like we take them at their word that they built these plumbing systems. We, we can see evidences of that, but oh, this thing doesn't exist. This thing's not real because we don't see it today. Yeah. But it, it's just, it we've, we've talked about the chimera sort of situations before, obviously like with mop and things like that. But of course, with like the pan character, you hear these accounts of, you know, goat headed beings, right. things like that, cloven hoofed things, which comes in bizarrely more often than I would ever expect it to in, in listener stories. Um, but centaurs is uniquely yes. amazing. Yeah, they, they really are. You'd be shocked. We've had people write in stories that have seen them. Uh, I remember one time a guy was hunting. I, I don't remember if he was bow hunting or muzzleloader hunting, but he was hunting and he said it was early morning. It was light. The sun hadn't risen yet, but it was light enough to where you could see. And he said he could hear something moving through the brush. He assumed it was a squirrel or whatever. And when he looked, he saw a centaur walk so through the woods and and walk off he said it never stopped he never said nothing that's nuts he wasn't sure if it was you know like you said physical or imagined but he saw a centaur and we did an interview with a guy years ago are you familiar with a man named j nathan couch Hmm. that's not doesn't ring a bell does it yeah okay well he wrote if you're interested in this kind of stuff he wrote a book called goat man flesh or folklore and he has it down all kinds of sightings in there of people seeing centaurs and and hooved people like that and it's really bizarre pan-like satyrs yes you know everybody pictures a satyr like playing a pan flute and stuff like that it's really bizarre and it makes you wonder again where did all these stories come from perhaps long ago there was a race of these things or you know we always talk about you can see ghosts of people why couldn't you see ghosts of something that once existed but doesn't anymore so maybe that was the ghost of a centaur because i don't know hundred thousands of years ago they were around i don't know right you never see ghosts of dinosaurs either you know what i mean but I've heard accounts of ghost mammoths, you know, where they have a seemingly uh, semi-physical mammoth apparition. You know, I've heard those and they're usually just auditory. And it makes me wonder if like that's, I, I have this theory, if you will. Jeremy's crazy corner. Jeremy's crazy corner. <laughs> I feel like that there is an expiration date. There's like a, a flight delay for uh, spirits, souls of all kinds of things, people, animals. It, it, it's, you often hear stories of people like in colonial garb or, you know, 1800s. 
but you don't hear, it seems you don't see a lot of cavemen ghosts. Not a lot of Neanderthals. Right, yeah, I feel right. like, I feel like eventually, I feel like there's like a holding area for people maybe that experience certain trauma, were involved in sort of some sort of historical violent event or tragedy where they're stuck for a while before they figure it out and move on to the next life. Maybe that's a possible idea, but it seems like eventually things and people do move on. So you have very few remaining that are these ancient dead things. Yeah. But purgatory yeah 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 it's like a purgatory that's like that ex- coexists mm-hmm. with this plane until they can figure it out i don't know that seems like the case there have been fascinating stories of people running into yeah what sounds like a mammoth or something in the world they don't see anything but it's like right up on them in the woods um just bizarre stories like that there's i saw, I saw uh what looked like a gallimimus ghost dinosaur we did like a live stream and there was a video of this this thing that passed from this guy's apartment and it, it was a genuine video i believe the guy he didn't even know what he was looking at but it was caught in the background and it just looked like a yeah. like a freaking dinosaur running past okay there is proof of a ghost of a dinosaur i wasn't yeah. aware of that i mean if that's what it was well, send it to you get your thoughts it but. could have just been a giant <laughs> demon that looks like a dinosaur but anyway let's roll the story because i think we set up pretty well uh this one john you got it here we go centaur from expanded perspectives What's up, you guys? This is Jay from North Carolina. I got a story for you uh, about your uh, recent Centaurs episode. Uh, my grandfather told me this story when I was younger. He grew up in a small town right outside of Brilliant, Alabama, and he was one of 12 brothers and sisters that lived on a farm there back before the Depression. But he told me the story how um, one summer his family, they were sitting outside on the porch it was hot in the house, you know, everybody was sitting out there cooling down uh, summer evening, and uh, they started hearing footsteps coming up the, the road there, and it sounded like a horse. So they were all, of course, watching to see who was going to be passing by on the horse, and as the, <laughs> the horse approached, it stopped at their, the top of their driveway, and it was, uh, I guess you would call it a centaur, half man, half horse. And it stopped and looked down the driveway at them sitting on the porch. And then they said it continued on, went on down the road. But a couple of weeks later, his, uh, my grandfather's oldest brother, Byron, had actually passed away. So uh, just a little crazy story that he told me growing up about a creature that he saw. He had some other crazy stories that... He told me too, uh, growing up, but, uh, anyway, I'll just leave it at that one for now. Thanks for the show. You guys, I enjoy listening to you guys as I'm driving from Minnesota to Mississippi out on the road all the time. You guys keep up the, the good work. Thanks. Bye. So weird. Yeah. That would be a conversational thing that would yeah. never. Every time you get together, <laughs> there'd be that conversation. Remember that time we saw a centaur? Yeah. How do you forget that? Yeah, it's yeah awesome. right. I mean, and, and, and to say it was mistaken identity, what could they mistaken it for if it wasn't <laughs> right. a centaur? You know, a very, very some naked like, man on a horse who's very I wonder thin. how far away it was. Yeah, I don't know. You know, you, you could easily misidentify a black bear as possibly being a Sasquatch, but a, a half man, half horse. How does that happen? I mean, yeah. unless the man was laying on like <laughs> over the horse's head With or like something. a black fur coat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, and I think about the time, too. Everybody at that time of Americana knew what a, a man horseback looked like. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, it's this is commonplace. It's not like, yeah. it'd be like a man that was half man, half car drove by your house right yeah. now. You'd be like, oh, that <laughs> exactly. was a man driving a car. You're like, no, you know what a car looks like. And a man looks like in right. a car, he's coming out of the car. Yeah, that's a terrific point. Because, yeah, I just read this weird statistic recently about in Britain, because there was some weird sighting, and they said that horses were, or I think like the 1800s or something, horses were uh, one horse for every 10 people. And then nowadays it's like one horse for every 80 people or so. So obviously, I feel like it'd be even less. Yeah. Well, the statistics surprised me because obviously you just don't, especially, I don't know where we live, you just don't see people on horses. But back then, yeah, it was like that's your mode of transportation a lot of the time. So to misidentify that, to your I point. I just love that he walked up took a peek over the fence down the drive and then just continued on so, his way. It was so nonchalant. I love that. That's what I love about it. Yeah. The quick sighting. It wasn't like, and then he came into the house and we had tea. Like it'd be much harder to believe, but the yeah. fact that it was, it was this passing kind of. When you stand you know, up and go, thing. well, that's enough porch setting for the evening back in the house, y'all. <laughs> yeah, I right. don't know what's going on, but I'd rather go sweat in there than I would sit out here with these monsters. <laughs> exactly. Right. Well, and it doesn't yeah, have yeah. anything to do with his, the passing away of his uncle, whatever, yeah. right afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't quite get that part. 
Well, I was, was going to ask you guys, because he was referencing, you know, that you guys had done a Centaur episode, the listener who sent in a story. I was wondering, when you did your um, research on that, did you happen to mention anything about, like, a, an omen no. or something? To, okay, I was just curious, because it made, made me think maybe that was part of the, his uh, response. I wasn't sure if he was, yeah, relating it to that story. It was just a, some sort of... Yeah, uh, interesting. His brain kind of went somewhere else quickly. Yeah. Yeah, it could be just a coincidence. Had nothing to do with... One didn't have anything to do with the other, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Unlike that with the black dog phenomena, where it's usually... Oftentimes thought of as an omen. Mm. Sometimes, yeah. The yeah, Banshee. Mothman, same thing. Doppelgangers. Harbinger. Yeah. Yeah, Harbinger yeah. for yeah. something bad's about to happen if you see it. Yeah. Exactly. Well, maybe he's opened up a whole new can of research. Chris, if you're going to die soon, I want to see a centaur. <laughs> that would be one yeah. gift you could get. How about a dog, man? Not a bill, a centaur. I don't need a bill for your, your funeral. I want to see a monster. Yeah, that would be it for me. Not a bill. Oh, Jeremy's paying for nothing. Yeah, I'm, not paying, I'm not paying for any of that. If I had to pick uh, one, though, it, would, it wouldn't be dog, man. It would be something like that, like a centaur. Yeah, some, yeah just totally I personally don't want to see anything. I want somebody that's very, very close to me that I trust intimately to see this, to witness it, so I don't have to deal with it. So I can go, oh, that's awesome. Uh, yeah. That's awesome. That's a great point. It's kind of how I feel. I do not yeah. want to see it. See, I feel the opposite. I feel like I know this stuff exists, and I've had enough. I don't know. I just feel like life is hard enough. Yeah. Yeah, you know, life is hard, John. But thankfully, this episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. Yes. This time of year, God, it's hard. I have, I have a rough time in the winter, for sure especially as I'm getting older and the holidays are coming up and 39 years old, no kids. It can be sad. Microwave dinners in Ohio just gets dark and cold. I don't know, holidays seem to be the worst time of year for me. And Chris, I know you've had experience with some seasonal. Yes, absolutely. I bought one of those lamps that didn't do a very good job. Oh, the sunlight lamps. Yeah, but there are things that do help. Cognitive therapy is one I've had experience with when I was young and I was taking a bunch of different medications for a few years. Then I finally was introduced to a cognitive therapist and it pretty much kicked my OCD. So therapy has definitely been beneficial for me. And I think we could all use some. Yeah. So if you're thinking about therapy in general, BetterHelp is a really easy and intuitive way to get started. Yeah. I went through the questionnaire and you can tell the questions there are really going to help the therapist know where you're at. Absolutely. Yeah. And they are licensed therapists. They're legit. Yeah, I actually have a friend who does online therapy and she loves that it. it's flexible, you know, with her schedule. Super convenient. You don't yeah. have to worry about going to the office or anything. Yeah, especially if you're struggling with anxiety, things like that. And it's just definitely can be triggering to be around a lot of people, especially yeah. when you're going through something in the moment you need help. And I know, Chris, you don't like to talk to people on phones. You won't even order pizza over the phone. So luckily, depending Wait. on your comfort level, <laughs> you can either text, chat, phone, or video. So however you want to communicate to your therapist, have it your way. Have it your way. It better help. <laughs> I don't think we can give them that tagline. <laughs> <laughs> I think somebody has that tagline already, but yeah, yeah definitely check them out. They're great. And thank yeah. you to BetterHelp for sponsoring us. Absolutely. Yeah, check them out because they support us. So visit betterhelp.com slash belief hole, all lowercase one word. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash belief hole. You'll get 10% off with the show code. Oh, so check them out. I do. Anyway, what were you saying, John? Yeah, so life is hard. And like I said before, I would rather just observe all this paranormal craziness more from a distance and being like, yeah, I think a lot of this stuff is real. I see what you're saying. But having to actually deal with it in your life, live with the consequences or have something. I think more it's like, I just don't want to get something attached to me because oh, I, right. I've already had, I feel like things attached to me and I don't want any more. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to roll those dice. Centaur would probably not attach. I wouldn't mind me. a centaur. I mean, especially if he gives you rides. That's true. You know? Could be handy. That was good, Chris. Well, How was, come you never hear the other way? You never hear like a guy with a horse head. <laughs> oh, actually, <laughs> this brings up a great point. Oh I'm glad gosh. you said that because uh, off the wall one I grabbed because of this story was a, a oh, short man. one minute story we got from um, a fellow named Perfect Segue Shane Shane, and he lives on a reservation, and he sent in this quick story. So I'll play it real quick. Yeah, and this is this is great. Play it up, John. I was driving towards a reservation in New Mexico and I swear to God I saw a horse on the right side of the road. As I passed and got closer, it was then a man about five foot six. But the crazy thing was it looked at least seven, eight feet tall as I was approaching. I'm in a lifted truck, so I have a good kind of top view of everything and that just scared the shit out of me. The craziest part is I hate horses. <laughs> they scare the living shit 
out of me That's and funny. that just was really kind of disturbing because um that would be it was a horse i saw four legs i saw a big rump i saw a big tall head and then right as i was passing it five foot six man so what the f that's why you don't pick up <laughs> um hitchhikers and i was about to hit record on my phone but i was in like such disbelief and i kind of got scared and i didn't but i really wish i did but holy crap um yeah you gotta watch out when you're on the reservations out here <laughs> thank you shane yeah Man, what a weird i love that his his advice from that was that's why you don't pick up hitchhikers yeah <laughs> that's what you took away from it <laughs> such a crazy story but it's funny because it, it just reminds me back to what we were talking about a, a little bit ago but like if you're gonna if you want to scare somebody you find their fear and what do you say he's terrified of horses terrified of horses exactly yeah. right so, it feels almost like a skinwalker like he saw it yeah, yeah. like it's Definitely. essence yeah like what he could see yeah, it's, it's like it yeah there we go it's like it john relates <laughs> everything to it <laughs> It does. It, use, it uses your fear against you. I would have to ask you guys, because you guys are the same relative generation, are you a preference to the Tim Curry? Tim Curry all the or, way. Yeah, uh, me too. Yeah, the same for me. I'm, yeah. I'm down with anything Tim Curry does. I, like I don't care all. from Rocky Horror Picture Show all the way to yeah. him. I'm a Tim Curry fan. Congo. No, uh, the Gorillas. <laughs> Earth 2. Uh, Clue! Clue is fantastic. Clue is amazing. Oh, yeah, man. still holds up. <laughs> the Tim Curry is an amazing person. Yeah, yeah I is. love Tim Curry. Have you guys seen Earth 2? Mm. Ooh, the series, the sci-fi series from like the early 2000s yeah. or something. It's one of his uh, few TV series. No, I don't think I have. I haven't even seen Earth One. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I am That's really behind the. Sorry, Tim. <laughs> That's on me. He's disappointed in you now. Yeah, everybody's disappointed in Cam. <laughs> yeah, it's it's fine. That's the way I live my life. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, the, the skit. There you go, John. Hey, hey John, got I got children. Late. That's why they're disappointed. <laughs> But yeah, this, the Skinwalker theory is... Oh, John, now John's on the sound box. To come to go. Sorry. John's got my back. I'm These are not my sound effects. <laughs> they just, just so you know. They come with Riverside. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, the Skinwalker thing, yeah. It, obvious obvious uh, connection there because, you know, the reservation, whatever it was, Navajo Reservation, where you have the Skinwalker lore. Right. Um, transformation. It just reminded me of an interesting point. Like, people always say, well, Skinwalker, you know, dogman, werewolf type creature. But the Skinwalker can literally turn it... I think it's pretty much everything except... I think it's sheep. Was that what it was? We did a deep dive. Obviously, witch, native witchcraft. I think Nam was it Navajo specific? Yeah, there's a really good book written on it. Um, someone who embedded themselves with a reservation. But that was one of the things that apparently that the witch doctors cannot impersonate. It. I think it's sheep. It's just an interesting. Why? I don't know. Maybe because so it has they can to only be change a into predators. Yeah, that was going to yeah. Like horses. Wow, that's a like very... Horses. There you go. You're saying a horse eat a chicken? Keep bait. watching. Yeah. <laughs> that goes to my point that horses are man-eaters. Jeremy did do a really fantastic Jeremy's Crazy Corner members episode on man-eating horses. It was actually... Really, there was a whole book on it. They eat it's them really good. Well, they, they used to eat them. Well, they can be predators. They, yeah. can, they can consume flesh. Sheep are not predators. That's true. Well, I'm sure they... Did they... Are they like deer where they eat occasional like a little... Like a grub? Well, not even mice. <laughs> no, when sheep are well, born, they're looking for a place to die, so... <laughs> yeah, that's why you call them sheep. Yeah, like, right. Sheeple. They so have that name for a reason. I had uh, uh, one of my dad, one of his good friends, and I, when I was a, a young man, and I've told this story in the show before. I, he had told me and my father a story. Was they it was after hours? We were all sitting around their house. I'm sure there was beer involved. I wasn't drinking. I was like 13, maybe 14. He told a story that he said he went to you know stay with his grandfather or whatever, and this and the old man that was telling me his name was Fritz. Fritz, I thought was 118 at the time. He probably wasn't 65 <laughs> when I was a kid, right? So he's telling this story. So at the time, I'm thinking his grandfather, it must have been a thousand years ago. So he's telling this story is when he was a young boy, he went to stay out there with his grandparents or whatever. And his grandfather had had a problem with a, uh, like a coyote. He kept coming up and getting around the horses and the cattle or whatever. And so one day, I don't remember, if, I think they were uh, in the truck or whatnot. might have been horseback. But anyway, one day, they come across this coyote one evening, and the grandpa shoots it. Boom, right? And so he's like, I'm going to track it down. We're going to find it. So they start looking to try to find the thing, and Fritz talks about it. They find the blood, the whole deal. As they're tracking, they come across the way it ends up coming into this home, this old house. And they find a Native American woman shot and she is dead in the floor. And they go and tell the police, this is what happened, this is what we did. They bring the sheriff out there, they show where they shot the coyote, they show the blood trail all the way to the house, and there is like coyote tracks, there's all of this stuff going on. 
as it leads up to this house where they find this woman. And from the last time, the way he told it, nothing much really happened. It's like everyone around there knew she was a witch or was a shaman or was something along the lines, and they believed. Now, of course, this would have been a long time ago. So, like, when I'm telling this, I'm talking like it's coming from the 20s is when all this stuff probably was shaking out. So, also, I'm sure the community at the time probably wasn't real open-minded to Native American women, especially being alone wherever they were at in this whole deal. So, it could have been one way or the other, but Fritz told the story, too, that he was with him when his grandfather shot it. They both saw it. They saw it run off after it was shot, the whole deal. And then, as part of the trailing, this is what they found. So, it's not like the grandpa showed up and killed her and then went and got him. I was like, hey, look, hey, hey, what's going on? They saw him shoot the coyote. They saw it, the blood trail. They trailed it brought the sheriff in the whole thing and this is what they found and that's just always one of those stories that stuck with me i'm like i don't there's not enough right like fritz died years ago like i wish that i could have really fleshed it out now at this age to really ask more questions and to dig in to know more like what was the town name where did it come from is you know what was the sheriff's name do you know can i go back can i look can i find anything that was around this because if that's a fact how many yeah. more stories like that are out there across this nation of ours right. that's been just brushed aside? Well, it's so fantastic that you brought that up because we just had, and I'll tell it real quick, but it's a crazy synchronicity. Yeah. You go ahead and mention it, Jerry, if you want, because when you're saying just completely aligns with the submission we had, which then we found that synchronistic. Uh, go ahead, Jerry. So basically, I, I sat down and I, <laughs> I read this book Chris bought me for some reason. We just did an episode on witches for Halloween and this book came too late, but it was, it was witches of the Southwest, witchcraft in the Southwest, really great book from what I've read so far. And it opened with a story about the guy who wrote the book. Um, I think it's from like the early 1900s and he's being led up by a guide and the guide is like, Oh, we don't, we don't want to go this way. And so that just made him more curious. So he kept going, he gets up to this cliff top, this beautiful view, but he can't focus on the view because the guide is just like fidgeting awkwardly in his saddle and he doesn't know what's going on he's like okay mister we must leave now and he's like well i don't understand why, why what's the problem and he goes on to tell him that this is where a witch lives in the community or a witch does her work essentially in the community and this is where she had turned into a coyote and killed a local villager hmm. and she lives in the village I read that. I was like, that's a fascinating kind of story. And then I went downstairs and checked our email. And we literally that day got a listener story from someone on a reservation describing the story of a local witch woman who can turn herself into a coyote and that they don't talk about it. But it's just such a like a weird synchronistic. Yeah. And the book for just to clarify, was in 1974, Witchcraft in the Southwest, Spanish and Indian Supernaturalism on the Rio Grande. And this is a very well-respected book, Into the Strange. Uh, Mark Simmons is the author. We'll be doing an episode down the road on it. But but yeah, crazy. Just That's fascinating you brought that up and just weird, weird timing. And, and, and that could have been what this fella saw out there the whole time. I mean, the Skinwalker, everything based around the Skinwalkers is a very, very interesting topic. Yeah, and it yeah. seems crazy to, uh, to outsiders, but the people among those tribes, it's not crazy at all to them. Exactly. And, you know, they were so eager to dismiss the... The natives, no matter where you go, they always talk about, oh, the Mayans, their folklore is ridiculous. Or over here, the Egyptians, you know, they, they believed if you take these things, you'll have them in the afterlife. That's ridiculous. You know, it's always easy to dismiss yeah. the natives' yeah. beliefs. And why? Like, maybe they know. Maybe we should. They know more right. than we do. They're from yeah. here, not us. We're the new ones. We always talk yeah. about it in the Congo when they went looking for Mokele and Bimbe. Oh, yeah, exactly. Right. And they use the book and they use this whole thing. And and of course, they said, oh, they were tainted afterwards. And I'm like, yeah, but they weren't. The very first time that was ever done, the people were like, yeah, we know exactly what that is. Nobody should know what that is. Right. (laughs) Nobody. (laughs) Was was it prehistoric, long necked um, dinosaurs? And they're like, that's it right there. Yeah, they'd already described them. Well, he had brought pictures like of zebras, of things that they would never see. Yeah. And they were like, we don't know what that is, you know, and stuff that we already know exists. And you point to that and they start telling it its name and where it's at. Exactly. And the whole thing, you're like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. That's real? Like, you can take me to it? And they're like, sure. Yeah. <laughs> That's fantastic. All right. Well, uh, you guys cool taking a quick break? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think I need to burn some sage after the, the witch talk. <laughs> right. <laughs> Clean it out a little bit. But uh, yeah. All right, guys, we're going to be right back. All right. We'll be back. Sounds good. All right, guys. See you in a second.
All right, welcome back, everybody. Welcome back. We are going to dive into some more bizarre accounts from listeners of both ours and Expanded Perspectives, and it's going to be exciting. That's the best word you can come up with, is exciting? I know, I've used the same form, but... Uh, hey, I, I think it's actually kind of good, because he usually goes overboard. That's true. Exciting has never been used. Yeah, it's usually... These are going to be phantasmal? Ooh. <laughs> Mind-blowing. Mind-blowing stories. Mind-blowing accounts from listeners. Coming this uh, summer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do you want to do next, John? We got, um... I say we do... You want to do the abduction? Yeah, that, I think that's a fantastic story. Yeah, let's do that one. All right, so this story uh, is an incredible experience, very relatable to, I think, a lot of people who have encountered such a situation. I have an implant in my ear. Oh, that's true. Do you want to talk about that real quick? <laughs> no. Do you want to talk about that? <laughs> that's, uh, you got to go back to the old school episodes to hear that. John had an incredible experience in Austin, Texas, and shortly thereafter, when I heard the story from Kelsey that we're about to play, it reminded me of your experience in Austin, Texas. I know, a little bit. Maybe you can talk about it after the story. It's not nearly as interesting as hers, but... It's still strange. Well, she didn't bleed from her ear. That's true. All right, let's play it up, Chris. All right, this is from Kelsey. This is the abduction. Hey, guys, this is Kelsey. Um, the story takes place in Drayton Valley, Alberta. I'm fine with you keeping that in. It's not a big deal. I'm on the Facebook page anyway. But here's my story of an alien abduction, I believe, when I was a child. So, the story takes place between 2003 and 2005, probably. I can't remember fully, but I was a young kid. One night, me and my mom were watching a movie in her room. It was, I know this is stupid, but it was Godzilla and his son. And then before I knew it, we were uh, asleep. I don't remember falling asleep, I just know that I was asleep. Then I woke up and I couldn't move. So I try to like move, but nothing's happening. And then I could see something out of the corner of my eye. And I look and it is a gray. Probably about five feet. I start to freak out, obviously. And before I knew it, I'm trying to struggle to move. And I actually do move. And I kick it. When I kick it, I can feel cold rubber. And it sways a bit, but doesn't actually move too much. And when I do this, it looks upset. Like, it looks like it's mad at me. So, I am just kind of staring at it, and it's just staring at me. And then I am, I'm asleep again. The next thing I remember is I am in my backyard, looking up at the sky, and I can see the craft. The craft is your basic triangle-shaped craft, lights on each point, and it's, it's humongous. It's like football fields wide. So after that, I am asleep again, and it's the morning, and I'm back in my house. I obviously am freaked out. I just think it's a dream just a really bad dream and I never talk about it again so a couple of years go by I'm probably in my 20s early 20s and me and my mom are talking about spooky stuff we're talking about paranormal stuff and I tell her this story and it absolutely terrifies her because she told me when she was younger herself she was taken as well by aliens so that's the story hope you can use it you guys are doing great work talk to you soon bye that's intense yeah thank you kelsey 
What an unfamiliar story. Let's get her mom on. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I was thinking the whole time. That's the twist at the end where you're like, wait, what? Right. I know, right? That's what seals it. I want to know what happened to you her. You hear that? The lineage thing. I mean, that's a yes. very common thing in a, the abductee phenomenon. Is, yeah, for sure. You're right. They're able to track it generationally. It's pretty interesting. I also like the, the way she says it. felt like it, she was kicking rubber. Yeah. That's so weird. Yeah, have you heard that before? Because I've heard that no. in another account. You haven't heard that? So I've, I've heard, like, never like, heard that they feel like rubber. I've read about that. And I've also, they theorize that they're not biological beings, you know, that AI, yeah. like drone. Exactly. Drones that may have some sort of like rubber shell. But see, well, that's the odd thing. You have the ability to have that much technology, but yet you coat it in rubber. Yeah, that's a great point. Maybe that's just what it feels like. Yeah. Well, maybe there's a state like, you know, because you, you hear the, the transmuting of uh, physical walls, for example, they can walk through. Maybe Maybe there's a limited amount of material that can have that that sort of per permeability might be we should call our show the speculators it's gonna be good <laughs> well i mean yeah. there's a lot of people like kelsey out there kicking them and they're tired of getting damaged so they just make them out of rubber it's <laughs> that's a great point. It's true. <laughs> easy to repair they bounce back yeah that is a terrifying story though the alien yeah. abduction stories are something that i don't really personally like to look into they're freaky because it is a truly terrifying experience that it doesn't sound like anyone can truly escape well, that's the thing is you're, you're totally vulnerable to the situation. There's no escape from that when you're in that position, it sounds like, which is horrifying. Yeah. I, yeah, my, you know, I'm always trying to like corroborate stories and, and Google stuff. And one thing that stuck out to me of hers, and this is like a weird skeptical bent I went on was just, uh, the movie. I just Googled son of Godzilla. Oh, this is, yeah. by, by the way, we will put a clip in the show notes. That, that is a clip from the actual movie in the, in the sound. Is it really? Yeah. You see, we saw part of the movie. Well, I just put it, I grabbed a clip from the actual film. Okay. You can, you can look up clips on YouTube and it's adorable by the way, mm -hmm. the son of Godzilla, isn't it? Uh, it is very, it reminds me of, uh, what was that one TGIF show? Oh, uh, dinosaurs. dinosaurs. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> Not the mama. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but, saddest final series ever. Oh my gosh. The final episode. We've talked about it on the show before. Yeah. That's dark. It's so dark. The dad is it? I forget the name. The dad's name is it Carl? I can't remember. That. Carl. Isn't that yeah, it? Carl Sinclair. Yeah. Sinclair, I think, is a playoff of the uh, the gas company out west because they're fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. Sinclair. But I remember the, his line at the end is like, "Dinosaurs have been here for hundreds of millions of years. <laughs> it's not like we're just gonna disappear." And then there's a sad music as it pulls out from the window the to like an atomic is, frost. There's like seven feet of snow on the outside. Sitting there as a kid like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so sad. How do you do write that as a child's show? TGIF. You're supposed to be happy. It should be called Thank God It's Final. Because that's <laughs> the, the last of the world. Friday. <laughs> Anyways, the, uh, I googled the, yeah, the video and I did notice that the son of Godzilla is a man in a very rubbery suit. He looks exactly like the baby from... The dinosaurs yeah well that's where i wasn't going with that but yes it does but it is a actor in a rubber suit so my initial thought was like well maybe she fell asleep and had a dream but then yeah it's the corroboration she wakes up and sees the craft which of course may be a dream as well but then the fact that her mom the mother has that yeah obviously she was very affected by her daughter telling the story yeah this happened to me and then I mean, we hear that so often that it is like connected through bloodlines they follow you yeah and i don't know we'll have to ask kelsey but in the recording and John, you're the sound engineer, but it sounded like she was almost getting choked up at the end when she was no, talking about her mom. No, she definitely sounded very emotional at the end. Yeah. Like she was holding it back. Like she felt, almost felt bad for her, what her mom went through. Like, yeah, she was dealing with the emotion again yeah. towards the end. Yeah. It's almost showing the generational difference as well. Yeah. Is that Kelsey's willing to talk about it. Her mother never said a word. Exactly. What a world we live in now. I remember yeah. going to libraries when I was a, a kid in elementary school and you know, being very into this stuff. And getting very upset that books written by researchers on ufology or the Encyclopedia of Ghosts was the one we picked up in yeah. fourth grade. Jeremy and I, being twin brothers, we were in the same class a lot. We used to take the books, they would put them in fiction, but they were written as research books into the paranormal or the supernatural or ufology, whatever. We would take them from the fiction section and put them back in the nonfiction section because we were outraged. <laughs> <Young kids. laughs> yeah. So it's a different time. Yeah. Now it's, it's just so, you know, you can talk about it at work. Yeah. Well, and. Let's just say, you know, if, if you were abducted and had been suffering from this and then you had children. Yeah. To me, this is one of those things that you would have to pick the right time. But you need to have a talk with your kids about that if it was something that had happened to you. That's a great point. Because the last thing you want is for something like that to happen to your child. Then your child not feel comfortable enough to even tell you about it. 100 percent. Birds and bees and extraterrestrials. Yeah. So the mom, not knowing that any of this, she may not have ever looked into anything ufology, yeah. done any research in it. This may have happened to her mother a few times, and then that's it. That's as far yeah. as she wants to go. She didn't know that it could be 
actually linked to family lineage and could yeah. continue on that it may have been her mother or father or grandparents yeah. that had it happen and what brought it to them and that they follow this along. You don't know. And does yeah. it sound crazy? Yes, it sounds crazy. But what's the harm with having that conversation and being wrong? Right. I mean, compared I to not at, having it and then it happening. I mean, we're at the point now where government is basically saying they can't figure out what is going on mm -hmm. with these unidentified. I mean, I think we're past the point of, I think most people that are somewhat open are willing to at least kind of have some openness to this idea yeah. that there's more out there than... Especially nowadays. I mean, I feel yeah. like with every phenomenon, I feel like there's no mindedness and so much of it has become a glob on pop culture thing where sometimes I'm like, hey, I, you know, I used to get made fun of for thinking this. And now it's like, you know, there's <laughs> hordes of different groups online that talk about this stuff. Now Mulder's cool. Yeah. <laughs> Mulder's cool. <laughs> and now the ability to listen to the things like y'all cover and that we cover all the yeah. time and that it's accepted. You're almost desensitized to it. It brings right. you to the fact of like... I'm waiting for it to happen instead of yes. there's no right. way it can ever happen. Yeah, there's almost like a, I feel like the more this grows and the more that people are more of my to the more, you know, of course you have the mix in of, you know, there are some shows out there that do creepypasta and openly, and it's not all like deceitful, mm -hmm. but there, I think with it being sort of a popular culture thing, people who would be interested in it almost get turned off because they think it's all fabrication because it has become a popular thing yes. to just tell stories. Where it's like, you know, I think with your show and our show and a lot of other good shows out there, it's like we look for the ones that are the most believable, people who are sincere with accounts. That's key. If you're taking it seriously. Right. Also, you think about like thought forms and tulpas. Well, then mm -hmm. you wonder, do these shows, as we share this information and more people hear it and focus on it, are we creating more yeah. of these things to happen? Is this yeah, self-fulfilling in a way? Ooh. Absolutely. We're moving into a, a new paradigm, I feel like. Where we manifest things from our discussions. Potentially. Can I start talking about Parents. cheesecake? <laughs> cheesecake? <laughs> it just sounds good Let's right now. We're going to manifest something. I need to manifest some cheesecake right now. Right now right? Oh. For no other reason, it just sounds really good. <laughs> we, did a, we did an episode. I have the book right here if I can see it. Uh, Mutants and Mystics. I don't know if you guys have seen this book at all. The guy, he works at Rice University and he's an, uh, a won't professor hold that against him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you're familiar you're from that area relatively yeah. uh but really great book though but he basically covered a lot of um popular fiction writers mostly comic book some film like constantine i forget the different authors he covered but he talked a lot about their personal lives with uh manifestation or sex magic in some vein uh, i forget the guy you're talking the, about characters that would come to life right they yeah run was, into something that they wrote like a tulpa right anybody out there listening wants to check it out it's a great book where he documents a lot of these different uh, accounts of authors who've claim to have had run-ins with their own characters, things like that. But it's a whole fascinating aspect to reality. It's just one more perspective expanding. Yes. Yeah, for sure. I got to read that now. <laughs> you want to move on to yeah, the next let's, story? Let's jump on it. You guys ready? Uh, Speaking of perspectives expanding that maybe you cannot see unless you've seen the movie Predator. Oh, yes. The, I think we should. Oh, I'm sorry, John. Go ahead. Well, I, I just thought we might. Well, it's up to you. Yeah, I you mean, know, you do. You even picked one yet. I think Gary versus the sky would be a nice transition from what we just Oh, okay. Yeah, this connected. Oh, this is a great story. Yeah. So we did an episode. You guys are probably familiar with this phenomena, but uh, the Living Sky. I forget the author. Um, now, uh, Trevor James Constable. Yes. Nope. Nope. Well, Nope became a film recently, but the idea of living sky creatures, what you think is a a UFO flying saucer, turns out to be a living creature. This is a this is a theory that was popularized in the seventies by uh, researchers and has since kind of died off, at least it did over the 80s and 90s and 2000s, where it's more mechanical craft. You, you, know, you don't hear stories about, could these things be living life forms in the sky that we're seeing that are moving in bizarre ways? Organic UFOs. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this is, we did a, one of my favorite episodes, Living Sky Creatures, I think a few seasons ago, a great deep dive, but this is a, a story that relates to that in my mind. And this is from Gary. It's called Gary versus Sky Amoeba. Hi, my name is Gary and I live in New Haven, Connecticut, and uh, it was December 7th, 2008, at about 10.30 at night, you know, on the East Coast, and uh, I was just doing some stargazing on the uh, Chapel Street Bridge, and um, this yellowish apparition kind of started floating in the sky out of nowhere, and I started yelling at it, you know, here I am. And it came to me, but it, it came to me in a zigzag motion. You know, it would come directly south and then float to the east, 
directly south float to the east and then till it was floating over my head but uh when it got over my head it wasn't this yellowish apparition anymore it was i'm looking into a black hole <laughs> kind of like an amoeba form all around it. I was terrified. And uh, then when I calmed down a little bit, I asked, what are you? And then I thought to myself, should I run inside and hide under the chair? And that's when it started going away in that zigzag pattern. But now it was back to the um, yellowish apparition, you know? I was, I was petrified, man. But, uh, they are real. And it was huge, by the way. When it, when it was floating toward me, I thought it was kind of like a ghost or something, but no, it was more like an amoeba. You can see the black hole in the, uh, like Lido files. He, uh, has something from Ukraine where, you, you know, they have them floating over in the sky and then this plant abundance is getting a lot of videos because he has a special camera, but uh, it's real. And then of course, Trevor James Constable was taking photos decades ago. And of course, I'm, I was mocked and, you know, going out with my friends and I would tell a story to someone and, oh yeah, you know, come on, don't do that, Gar. Anyways, they're letting their presence be known. It's kind of... I don't know, it's frightening. The thing didn't harm me, though. That's that's the whole, I guess, the whole thing. Anyways, thanks for listening. Bye. Thank you, Gary. Pretty creepy story. Yeah. Just you can tell the emotion in his voice where he's just... It affected him. Yeah. Kyle and Cam, have you come across this idea before, the, the idea of the living sky? Oh, and yeah. Creatures that... Okay. Yeah, yeah. we've done a, a one or two, I think, episodes on it. About oh, like nice. the manta rays where they've seen them down here, like right along road yes. level with people driving and then the jellyfish and all of the, the things that what we relate to the sea people are seeing in the sky. Yeah. Strange. Have you seen the movie Love and Monsters? Uh, no, uh, I've seen clips of it. Yeah, I've seen clips of it, but I haven't seen the whole film. So there's a, a, a clip or a scene in that film where they have a thing called sky jellies. And that's what it always makes me think of is mm. it's jellyfish and they're in the sky and it's beautiful. Every time I think, I'm like, why couldn't that be a thing? Absolutely. Right? Like, when you get up in that upper stratosphere, I'm like, well, why right. couldn't there be something that lives up there? Exactly. Well, of course, because the deepest, darkest parts of the ocean for years, they said nothing lived down there, and then it turned out they were wrong. There's vents and stuff, and there's all kinds of life up there. So, yeah. down there, I'm sorry. So, why couldn't the adverse be true? We're way up in the atmosphere where we don't think anything can live. There's yeah. jellyfish up there that and something you know, slips around. Yeah. Because I've seen videos uh, from space and there's some weird looking stuff moving around. Yeah. Yeah. They look almost like ocean life in Organic. a way. It, it's interesting because like, yeah. when we did this episode, I remember thinking like we live at the bottom of an ocean of, of atmosphere because the <laughs> right. depth of the sky is so much higher than the, the deepest ocean. Um, what was it? I grabbed it here again just for reference. But yeah, uh, the atmosphere has five million times the volume of the oceans. That's five million Pacific Oceans, five billion. Uh, That's insane. Yeah, it's, it's insane. So the, the height is so much. So if you want to consider. But we drive a plane through occasionally. <laughs> Way low. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to imagine. It's that much bigger. Yeah, it was uh, Charles Fort, him and uh, other people too, of course, we covered that talked about accounts of, there was one where this, I think, school bus had been covered in some sort of. Um, Sky jelly. Webbing or something, but they find the jelly. They find this like jelly thing on the on the ground. There's police reports of it, and it you know goes away. And there's the skeptical argument was it was like frog sperm or frog, oh, yeah. frog like uh, you know growth of young froglings. Uh, but where do these things go if they do die up there? I mean, there's so many incredible accounts from. We covered one from a biology teacher who saw one of these things coming down, almost cloud like, drinking from a, a pool. I think in the UK, a pond of water, or something like that, or a small lake, and then ended up barfing on this guy. Uh, and this is a, a report that was um, collected by a well-known researcher at the time. I'll, we can put these links in the show notes. But there's so much interesting anecdotes out there that aren't talked about often. And it's, to me, it's one of the most incredible phenomena that's out there. The idea of something being in the sky, that you're, you're just out by yourself somewhere, you just get sucked up. Yeah, in the dark depths of the ocean, there's a different kind of camouflage. But in the sky, 
all you be translucent. Translucent, you know, you can be cloud-like. I think there's so many ways to camouflage in the, in the sky we would never consider. Well, you think about how much bigger, how much have we not explored of the ocean? Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. It's a ton. an enormous amount. Like, I don't know the exact percentage, but if the atmosphere is, what'd you say, 5 million times? Is that true? Uh, I have it in my note here. It's uh, 500 billion. I still can't wrap my head around that number. <laughs> Once it got atmosphere, past a certain, I'm like, I don't even, that's yeah. massive. After a thousand, I can't really. It's yeah. not. It's not five million miles tar, but it's the the, the volume. The is, volume is five million times the size. If you go up to, I think, before leaving the higher atmosphere. So right. obviously, there's layers to the atmosphere. It's miles and miles, miles higher, hundreds of miles higher. Anyway, I think it's real. I think we've proved. Is that it. five million times bigger? No, five million. Yeah, bigger as far as volume. Five million times yeah. the well, volume of the ocean. But that is what matters. It is. So if it's, <laughs> it, what percentage of the ocean has been explored? That's, I, I don't remember. It's that. a small it percentage. It is a small percent. Yeah. I watched SeaQuest and it was, it was a good amount. More than 80% of the ocean has never been mapped, explored, or even seen by humans. But it's just crazy to put those two together. Yeah, and, it uh, is. The, because how many times are people above like 70,000 feet? Maybe right. a couple rockets a year, but outside yeah. of yeah. that, no one's up there flying around. So there could be anything. Exactly. You can't hang out up there. We don't, we don't have a sky lab yet. It makes you wonder about all the unidentified flying objects or you, whatever you want to call them, UAP, whatever. But all the phenomena where there are bizarre accounts where they like give birth to each other. When you have to imagine, or you have to assume that it's a mechanical object from, you know, people have a hard time. Under, this blows my mind too, not to get off topic, but I hate when there are people that are like, I don't hate, but it, it bothers me when people <laughs> I don't hate. Some people say like, well, you know, you'll have an astrophysicist to say, I believe that there is most likely because of the Drake equation or whatever, that there is life outside, but there's no way they could get here because we know that this is how... Because my tiny little brain says so. We know that this is how we understand things currently, therefore they couldn't get here yada yada but either way at the end of the day like we still don't know like what could exist we don't know what's already here right even in our own atmosphere uh, i don't know it's an interesting thought to consider i've got a question for y'all what would shock you more to find out that there are aliens in that craft like the little grays or to actually see and find out that there is a whole ecosystem that lives up there i mean that's not uh, alien <laughs> like we think like i would be more blown yeah. away to know that they are giant amoeba and giant right. jellies. That would blow me away more than I'd be like, oh yeah, I get it. There's alien grace. Yeah. Okay. Oh, absolutely. You know what's so funny is like, I, I totally, I, I empathize with that question. And I, but my honest response after doing Sky Creatures episode and everything is that I'm more apt to immediately consider that there are things that we just haven't identified that live up there. And it's not to say that there aren't UFO craft from extraterrestrial civilizations that have visited or interdimensional or interdimensional or inner earth, which is one of, one of my favorites that could be up around flying. But I, I do think, I think deep down inside, I believe that there is an ecosystem, like you said, out there. But that would be much more mind blowing, much more magical too. Yes. Like I love that idea that they're part of our animal kingdom. We're so, uh, so removed from them by, by space, by distance. You think about the bottom of the ocean floor that has like lakes at the bottom yeah. and then you can go into the lakes and the, the ocean within the ocean freshwater mm -hmm. lakes and hollow earth theories and like it's well, just think never about ending. the number of people that go missing in the fog and the mist maybe that's how they hunt oh, they can come right. down oh, that's exactly that's what, that pulls it right back to the story well that's what terrified me when we did that episode and i looked up this term because it's, it's not quite the same thing but the term casadastrophobia which is the fear of being sucked into the sky it's a little different but i, I do have it but i have right that now. fear that's yeah. scary. Every time I lay down and there's a beautiful starlit sky, I'm always yeah. like, I'm a, I'm a little, I'm holding onto the grass a little bit. But if gravity stops. Yeah. yeah. And remember a couple <laughs> months ago, we were shooting down those Chinese balloons. So maybe they were up yeah. there looking for stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That came and went pretty quickly. Yeah. They just let that. We did a whole like live stream thing on that. One of the few that we did, but we covered every, all the different stories that were coming out and the different balloons, quote unquote. Just gone. And the, the strange questions of why. You know, you had some officials too coming out and saying like, oh, there was one specific official, I remember the name of the, the guy, Colonel or something, who came out and said, no, these are definitely not man-made. Uh, the Pentagon on the, you know, the classified side could have been tracking some of these balloons for years. Uh, certainly going back, you know, let, let's talk about those UFOs that were seen off the, you know, the USS Nimitz in the Pacific years ago. Remember we had those fighter pilots saying they saw this unidentified craft or moving quickly. Mm -hmm. Some of the pilots I've heard that have, sh including some of the ones uh, that have spoken to the pilots that shot down those craft over Canada and the one over Alaska yesterday say these were not balloons. These were, uh, you know, craft objects, if you will. They're very similar to those that were spotted uh, over the Pacific. So it's very concerning. There's certainly, uh, you know, something else the Pentagon's going to have to look for. But just talking, you know, just in the Navy, I mean, when you're, you know, standing watch and you have air search radar on, 
when you're looking at different objects in the air, they f fly, you know, profiles. You know what an airliner looks like. It flies a, you know, 20, 30, 40,000 feet. It's squawking on IFF. It's kind of like when the radar hits it, it kind of returns and says, hey, here's who I am. Whether you're Delta Airlines flight, for example, 952 or whatever, that's going to be seen on radar. So in the case of these hmm. craft, when those U.S. military fighter jets are flying alongside these craft, obviously there's no one to hail. There's no one inside to talk to. And in terms of a radar section, when you're they're bouncing off and just you're not getting your turn because it's it's mysterious okay so what what are they but you, you shot it down you know i don't know there were there were so many unanswered questions and they really didn't care to go find these things just on to the next thing in the news cycle it was strange even if it's a threat they just let it go you know and there's tons of arguments for why they let it go whether it's perception of well, it's so political too yeah everything just yeah but it was frustrating uh, but exciting <laughs> much like the show <laughs> well we got a couple more stories do you want to keep moving yeah how are you guys how are you guys feeling yeah you want to do a couple more okay okay well let's see boop, 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 boop. all right so this next account i know you guys are familiar with this phenomenon well, we yeah didn't... they brought the story to us so they... well obviously yeah you I, th I think yeah you guys have definitely covered the glimmer man yeah we did an episode uh season four i think on on the glimmer man phenomena which for any listener who's not familiar the concept is that people are experiencing things in usually in the forest uh sometimes there's some urban stories but Usually in the forest where there's a clicking sound, a lot of people equate it to the very well-known Predator series with a clicking, but it's an invisible, almost seemingly cloaked, where there's a shimmer aspect to it. And this is a great story submitted to Expanded Perspectives. Hello, my name is Daniel Velasquez. I live in Federal Way, Washington, and I wanted to call and report an experience that I had last August uh, 2018. And from what I've been reading and, and hearing on other podcasts, it can be uh, compared to what, what's been called the, the Glimmering Man, because um, that's exactly what I have experienced. I work in construction and landscaping, and what happened was uh, one day we were working in Seattle, and we were just getting off of the Interstate, Interstate 5, which uh, if you're not familiar with, Interstate 5 is the main vein between uh, Canada all the way down to Mexico. And we were near Seattle getting off of the exit. So what happened was, as we were getting off of the freeway, I was sitting in the, um, in the passenger seat of a vehicle with, that also had my boss who was driving the vehicle. And we had another gentleman sitting in the back seat. And I was just kind of leaning back. This was a, like I said, it was in August. It was a, a really hot day out. I would say it would probably be around between 12 to three o'clock in the afternoon. It was a nice warm day, nice and sunny. And as we were pulling off of the exit, I was just leaning back in the chair. I had the window down, getting you know some fresh air. And that's when I saw this, this, figure it was like a like I've been hearing it's been like exactly what it was is a like a pixelated figure of a person walking it was exactly like the if you've seen the old uh, the Terminator shows the movies not as the alien form but when he turns invisible when he has like this cloak on him it's hard to explain except for saying it's exactly like what you see on on the movie and I seen this form walking uh, to its right, and as we were getting up the freeway, and I seen this this pixelated figure of a human walking, I leaned up and I said, "Oh my God! Did you look at that? Look at that!" I told my boss, and I probably was watching it for about four seconds, five seconds before my eyes really registered on what I was seeing. I, I sprung up out of my seat. As we were getting off the freeway, I said, oh my God, look, look, look at that. And my boss was looking over, like what? And as I looked at my boss to try to grab his attention to, to point him where I was looking, when I looked back, I, I had lost the figure. I, I can't say if it disappeared or if I just lost how it had moved, but it was a very short sighting. Uh, I would say less than five seconds. But those five seconds were the absolute strangest thing that I've ever experienced. I'm, I'm 40 years old. I've never experienced any paranormal, no ghosts, no aliens. I've never experienced anything. 
and I'm not even sure if this was a paranormal sighting, but whatever it was, it was extremely strange. It was very odd to me. And this figure, you know, it was, it was normal shape and size of a human. Like I said, it was just walking. The place where I seen this, this pixelated human figure walking behind, behind him, maybe 20 or 30 yards, there was a group of uh, homeless people, maybe three, four or five people at the very most. And they just were kind of going about what they were doing. This was not exactly downtown. There was grass, there was brush, there were a couple little trees. And they had no idea from what I could determine that there was this figure walking in front of them. And it's just the most, like I said, the, the experience was short, probably less than five seconds, but it's something I can never forget. I, I don't know if it's something from the military, it has something to do with uh, extraterrestrial, or or what exactly could it be? I, I didn't get no feeling from it that it was something good or something bad. It was just complete and total shock seeing this. I tried to I explained to my boss what I was seeing. I wanted him to pull over the car and, and stop so I can get out, but uh, it just didn't happen that way. So it was a, a definite, um, for me, life-changing experience. I mean, what is that? What, what could it possibly be? And there it is, another Glimmer Man. Yeah, they're, they're bizarre stories, and we started getting an influx of them about three or four years ago where more and more people would hear other share their Glimmer Man experience and have been puzzled their whole lives, not knowing that somebody else saw what they saw, and then they would write in and tell us about their account. And we've yeah. had them from different parts of the world, even, not just in one geographic location. Yeah, so that would, would that, is I, I feel like I've, I've heard you guys talk about this before, and you tend to lean away from the military aspect. Oh, right, because that is one argument, right? Like a secretive... Cult. Sure, but I think it would be foolish for the military to be testing out their top secret camouflage and going into people's homes. Right, because those are stories, right? Yeah, the risk because of that. Yeah. if they were to stop you somehow, then your secret's out. It seems like a right. foolish way. Yeah, that would be a huge cover-up that would have to ensue. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and of course it could be something like that, but it doesn't seem like it. There's several stories, you know, where people are out hunting, where they're out hiking. That's how it all kind of started, yeah. it seemed like. But then there's other stories of it inside their homes. And what's odd is some of the stories go back predating the movie. Right. Yeah. Exactly. They didn't know about it. Then they seen the movie that came out in the 80s and they're like, oh my God, that's exactly what I saw. Right. I think, uh, I don't know if, if it was predating the movies. I think it was, but I'm not sure. But the one I remember that set it off, at least in my mind, was Jan Maccabee. I don't think that predated the movies. It didn't predate the movies. You're I'm sure familiar with that case, but it was, I think her husband invented some sort of software or something. He was a known, a known guy of some sort. Bruce Maccabee is an American optical physicist formerly employed by the U.S. Navy and a ufologist. While employed at the Naval Ordnance Laboratory, his work included optical data processing, generating underwater sound with lasers, and involvement in the Strategic Defense Initiative and Ballistic Missile Defense using high-power lasers. While Chris is embarrassingly wrong, and this did not predate the movie Predator, Bruce did use his experience and expertise in optical physics to analyze a photo taken by his wife of anomalous phenomena while hunting in 2010, which some believe to be an encounter with the so-called Glimmer Man. But his wife, Jan, I think was deer hunting, and she had seen something like this uh, moving through the trees and had taken a picture, and there's a picture available, and we can link in the show notes, but this is one of the first accounts that I'd ever heard about it when we were looking into it. But the story was pretty incredible. But basically, like she noticed it as she was hunting and she was like, is that just a, am I seeing something weird in my glass or whatever she's wearing? And then like, no. And then she's like watching it. And it was a distortion, as you often hear. And then it moves through the trees and she snaps a picture, which we can include. But is out there is the, as this phenomenon sounds, if, for those of you who have not heard of this phenomenon, it seems to be a relatively recent, but arguably real phenomenon that's been going on. And as you guys said, it's, this is something that's been reported in the past and globally, which just makes it even that much deeper of an interesting conversation. Yeah. And it's very similar to like Fey encounters. Like they'll be out, say, walking their dog. I remember a story in particular that a college girl, she was going to the University of Florida and she had lived uh, in an apartment complex, you know, miles away from the campus. And there was a, a park that she would always take her dog for dog walks and stuff. And then she was at this park. She said it was kind of remote and it was very large. And then she noticed the dog kept looking at something in the tree. And she's very familiar with her pet. 
was acting unusual. So she started looking like, what does he see? Squirrels or whatever? And that's when she saw it. And she said that it was surprised that she saw it, but it knew that she saw it because it tried to, again, it tried to hide. And they're, they're almost impossible to see when they're not moving, but it's when they yeah. move them and they look pixelated, much like in the movie. So people are theorizing, like, what is that? Is that an extraterrestrial that's able to do that? Is it Sasquatch and it's able to camouflage itself? Yeah. Is it time travelers who are coming back to look Ooh. at the universe and they camouflage themselves? Like, you could go to sandbox vr and play like you pay a fee and they can send you back in time where do you want to go for like an hour but it's not quite that's perfect a great you know? idea i mean that's an interesting interesting theory because you think about like you don't want to cause a butterfly effect something like that where you disrupt something you would the best way to do is to be in camouflage while you witness what's going on yeah i hadn't heard that one that's that's pretty fascinating yeah i mean if i could go back in time right now and go to ancient egypt and i could be invisible and walk among the pedestrians and stuff that would be awesome yeah. right that'd be great Let's do it. But you wouldn't be invisible. You'd be pixelated and someone True. would report well, you. You're just going to make sure looking when you move. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Well, another thing I always think about, too, with the military angle of it is it would be so much easier to test it on your own people. I mean, yeah, you have people that work there. You would know everything about them. You would know intimately if you could trust them or not if something were to go awry as compared to just releasing it into the general public. Right. You want to do it on a base or something. I mean, you release it in somebody down here and you slip into somebody's house, you're liable to get shot. There's probably a 95% chance you're going to see if that camouflage is bulletproof. Right. That's a good point. Yeah, I feel like we've heard tests of the military and, uh, or plenty of those, yeah, yeah, that on on our own population, but never involving, that I know of, military personnel. Yeah. Were they, were they testing on military personnel? I mean, like, uh, we, I mean, because they do that. Well, I mean, testing on the population. Like, it's not military personnel that have reported seeing a glimmer man right. in their home. Oh, right, right, right. I see what you're saying. Like, we've done tests on the, po- on the U.S. populace in different cities and places before, but not where you have to involve, you know, we're not, you're yeah. physically in the interior of a home. Yeah, totally. Well, like Cal and I have discussed off air, you, you don't see the, like the Navy SEALs practicing raids on everyday people. You know, right. they're not using paintball guns and running all this stuff to <laughs> see how they would really react. As yeah, compared but no one to would just believe theoretical. you. Exactly. <laughs> no, you're, you're 100% right. That's a great point. It just seems like it's one of those deals. It's the best thing that fits it is almost like what Kyle says is it's, it's almost like they're in a suit. Somebody is paid as a time traveler, let's say, and you're in this certain suit and the suit has all these special abilities. So you can basically survive any terrain, any atmosphere. If you get dropped in the ocean by accident or, you know, whatever happens. It's to cover their butts. So that's yeah. the reason they can climb trees. They run real quick. They vanish. But they're literally there just to, to kind of watch. Or maybe it is a group of what used to be known as the Watchers. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Biblical times. One other interesting fact about the Glimmer Man is, you remember the researcher, the UFO researcher, J. Allen Hynek? Oh, yeah. Great goatee. Well, his son, Joel Hynek, worked on the production team for the movie Predator. Really? I did not know that. It makes me wonder... <laughs> if dad jay allen Heineck senior told joel about something he uncovered while yeah. doing all his research and joel passed it along to the visual effects guys and that's how did, they yeah. created it did you know that's so fascinating because when we did the glimmer episode i was reading the youtube comments and there were some fascinating stories of people saying very similar kind of accounts of uh, you know Either my father told me this and he was in Cambodia or whatever before it predates the Predator movie where they witnessed something out there. Yeah, I remember that. Like something existed before this that may have inspired Mm -hmm. the film, which would be fascinating. The sound is interesting because the sound is uh, very distinct and that's what people, you know, and and I think in this, the listener story, they said Terminator. It was, of course, Predator, but Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, he's in a lot of stuff. But that's the sound that is ubiquitous through these accounts. It's about the clicking? Yeah, Yeah. the clicking. I actually saw a documentary on how that came yeah, about a crab right no oh so see someone wrote in, in our last episode because we mentioned the glimmer man and someone said that it was the sound guy or whoever had recorded a dying crab and that was the no clicking. that's not really? how it, no it was an actual person that made that yeah sound. but the, the inspiration for it was a, i a don't crab? think so okay. no no he just happened to have this might have been a cover rare up. ability <laughs> he was on the sound stage and like made the sound really yeah oh, that's wild but he might have been selected because... That's a CIA lie, John. Yeah, it goes real right. deep. <laughs> hey, you never know. <laughs> Maybe. They could have got the guy. You know, and then there's some say- sightings of, they say, of the Glimmer Man, that it's a, uh, it's a misdiagnosed, or uh, they think it was a, a ghost. 
some people thought they, I'm, I'm oh. messing up my words. Somebody thinks they saw a ghost for years, and then when they hear the stories of the Gloom Man, you're like, you know what? That wasn't a ghost. It was something cloaking itself. Oh, because they saw like a semi translucent. Yeah. yeah, I can see that. That's way more creepy. Yeah. Because this thing is alive and conscious, and I thought it was just a ghost. Correct. Ew, that's, yeah. When you go to interact with it, ooh. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> hey, here's you, Ray. Come in, Ray. Pitman! I saw it! I saw it! I saw it! It's right here, Ray. It's looking at me. He's an ugly little spud, isn't he? I think he can hear you, Ray. Last thing I'll say about this, you, you said that, uh, what if it's time travelers from the future and they you know, drop them off in different places to make sure they have these suits to protect them and what if they get dropped on the ocean? I just had the sad thought of all these future people that are just <laughs> laying dead and visible on the bottom of the ocean floor. No, they, they just had to walk their mark. It's just a long walk. <laughs> it's a long walk. <laughs> yeah. They're like, man, That's come true. on. <laughs> right? Crazy. It's just such a wild thing yeah because there's so many like there's aliens you know there could be centaurs it was you know ghosts parent but then you have this and this is such an outlier yeah of like it what does it do like there's not an overall abundance of them like we were talking about that it's not like you see all these ghosts in these haunted areas. like you don't see glimmer men in certain areas like oh right. yeah they're going to be around you know in a certain time at night and in these haunted yeah. areas like you don't ever know well it's similar to the sky creatures you yeah. just they just kind of appear randomly. That's why it makes you think it's a real biological thing. Yeah, that's why these things are the, the, some of the more fascinating things to at least look into for me. Definitely right? more elusive. Yes. More elusive, less talked about, and I think really interesting to dig deep into. Because when you start to find that there are people in accounts from around the world throughout time that have seen things like sky creatures, glimmer men, it really brings, in a way, an excitement into the field of researching paranormal, you know, Fordian phenomena, to mm -hmm. me anyway. Yeah, a little fre breath of fresh air. Yeah, a little freshness into it. De enough demons and ghosts yes to get those all the time <laughs> speaking of which let's go back to we got one final story yeah and this is a classic phenomena uh in a way uh this is a story from where's my note this is a classic account of of children as we touched on the beginning of the episode oh yes children being potentially more sensitive to very aware of energy i mean this is an interesting story because it is you don't really know where the genesis of the child's thought forms come from Right. And what they're tethered to, to give them these uh, perceptions. Yes. yes. Well, that's enough preview. Yes. This comes from Becky and this is called They Don't Wake Up. Hey guys, love the show. Um, just want to say if you're ever in Grand Rapids, hit me up. Let's go find the Michigan dog man. Let's settle this once and for all. Yes. Anyway, this is a story <laughs> about my then two and a half year old son. And at that age, they can barely form coherent sentences. And we are at a funeral for a family member neither one of us has met. And he knows nothing about death. It's something his brain cannot comprehend. He's too young. He's never been to a funeral home or anything like that. Um, so I'm walking around with him, keeping him occupied. And there's a set of stairs. And he points to it. And he says, down there, there are people who are sleeping and they don't wake up. And I pause and I'm like, what, what do you mean by that? And he says, there are people sleeping down there and they won't wake up. And obviously down there is where they do all of the embalming and the processing of the body preparations before they bury it. So it's clear that he could pick up on something that they are more aware of things. They can see things. I don't know how he was able to you know, how he was able to form that kind of thought. But, you know, they'll definitely say some weird, creepy things, and then you're going to stay up late thinking about it. So that's my that's my story. Thank you, Becky. Thank you. I love that. Short little sweet ones like that where it just makes you think. I don't think we come here blank slate. Yeah. That's my opinion. I just think that we're much more intuitive than just coming in here and all of a sudden, you know, being children. Do you think we just lose it over time? Yeah, I, I mean, I mean, yeah. I was like we were, we were talking about it earlier in the show about children being more perceptive, right? Kind of feels yeah. like that. Absolutely. Well, that, and I don't think the soul starts in this life. I think it goes on. My personal opinion is that there's a preface and an epilogue. Is what you're thinking for the soul? Yeah, a preface and an epilogue. So this is the narrative, the earthly life, and there's a there's a preface. There's a there's a story before. Yeah, uh, and then there's an epilogue. It goes on after. Yes, that is written briefly in the end of the book, but you don't get to read the rest of it. Really, it just not goes while on. you're here. Yeah, right. I like that idea. 
I don't believe in like the blank slate theory where you come in and you're just oh tabula rasa. Yes. Yeah. Are you familiar with the reincarnation stories of children? Oh yeah. Oh my yes. goodness. Yes. Where the kids are, you know, small at a very young age, starts talking about war stories. Ship. Yeah. It's plane he flew. Yeah. And it turns out all that's real. Mm -hmm. There's a guy we interviewed years ago named Jim Tucker. And he's got a collection of books called, the first one I think was Life Before Life, Children's Memories of Previous Lives. It's a really yeah. good read and went over to India and uh, they found some really impressive stories where these families would talk about these little kids being like five or six years old and they would meet older people and know who they are. They know their names and stuff. And they're like, he talks about his previous life. He's got, I got shot and the kid has a birthmark there. Yeah. Wow. And what's funny is as the child ages, he starts remembering less and less. And at the same mm. time, the birthmark dissipates. So it's like yeah. he goes oh, with crazy. the memory. Yep. But, yeah. You know, they know accurate details. But there's nobody told the child that there's no way they would know. And you see that case after case. It'd be one thing if it was once or twice. But, you know, there's story after story after story. Right. That's fascinating. I mean, it's specifically fascinating. The, the fading of memory with physical markers mm -hmm. is fascinating. It's like as we grow. Well, there in India. You know, reincarnation is a much more believed thing amongst the common folk. Mm -hmm. So yeah. to them, they weren't, they weren't as shocked as he was being from the Western world. Right. And there's the ability to listen to, I think, the young, if you have that built into your culture. Yeah, I think it's because it's much more accepted there, because obviously the tradition there and the religion there, like you, you're more minded to that. We're here. It's like we don't listen to the young or the old. <laughs> it's true. We don't. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's funny. Here, into that point, it's like, how many stories are we not hearing? Because the parents are like, don't talk about that. Right. You know? Or the parents just don't want to acknowledge that. And there are, there are some, we had a, a listener story once. She submitted a story where it was like, you know, you're not my mom, that kind of thing. And for her, it was emotionally upsetting because she, her daughter had all these memories that they later kind of corroborated. But for her, it was emotionally challenging because she was her mom. And there was this short period in the beginning when she was speaking, you know, at a younger age and just saying like these short sentences, like, you know, I know this, but you're not her. You're my, you're my second mom, my second mom. Yeah. For, so there's an emotional factor to it, it too. It would be hard. Yeah. But fascinating. I mean, it just goes back to what we've been saying this whole episode, which is the world is much more stranger than I think a lot of people understand, but probably not so much. I think they, a lot of them get it. Yeah. Our listeners, Expanded Perspective listeners, you guys get it. Yay! And thank you for tuning in to this episode. Thanks guys for joining us today. You guys are amazing. If you haven't already at this point, go to Expanded Perspectives. They are incredible. They are the OGs. <laughs> they they are the OGs of podcasting in general too. Yeah. Like they started at the beginning. I mean, you guys, you worked this field before we got onto the scene, and we were so excited that you guys want to do this with us because uh, absolutely, you've been an inspiration for us. Thanks for even inviting us. It's been great. I mean, like this, we love this. This is the this is the whole thing. The bread and butter of it is the stories of giving people an outlet, a place to know yeah. that you're not alone if you see something crazy, and that everybody wants to hear about it. That's what we love so much about the stories. Absolutely. I love doing the, the listener stories. The research episodes are fun and fascinating, but it's fun to just tell stories around a virtual fire. Yeah. You guys are brothers from other mothers. Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, especially since whose birthday is it? Or it just well, was? ours today, Chris. I know, but Cam yeah. or Kyle just had a birthday. Cam, okay. I'm about to. About to, okay. Yeah. Happy birthday to all of us. And who has the twins? <laughs> Kyle, I, I have twins. I have identical twins, 16-year-old boys. And you know, you know, these guys are identical twins too, right? Yeah, that's what you said. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting synchronicity. It's frustrating for a new listener sometimes because we, we sound, sound identical. identical. <laughs> a little. <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, it was uh, embarrassed. I don't know if your kids do this, but uh, we spend a lot of time together, obviously. So we, we try to not say the things at the same time. I'm trying to not say things right now while you're like talking. When we're talking to somebody at a gas station, what, what happened today? Oh, we went to a coffee, we coffee shop. And uh, we, you tell it. We ordered our beverage. No, we walked up before you could even order. This, this always happens. And they go, are you guys brothers? And oh my God. Every time. And of course, which I don't blame them because we are identical twins. And I, and we go, oh yeah, we're brothers. And they're like twins. And we're like, yeah, we're twins. And then we both at the same time smashed our fist on the counter and said, in a gentle way, in a gentle way. And we said, and it's our birthday. Like, <laughs> I, it's so a, cringe. In stereo. It was twin cringe. And then we both looked at each other and said, I'm sorry. Cause it's so, <laughs> it's just it's so off putting when you do twin stuff. It's just, it's yeah, we used to be a little less. We, it's so that's so ridiculous. We used to be a, a little less alike, but I literally was like, we didn't plan that. We're just growing up. We like spent more time apart. You made sure it was gentle at the same time. Now we live together. We spend almost every day together with the show. So it's it's so hard to not respond in identical. You're ways. on the same exact wavelength. I know. So we have to. We, we need have girlfriends. Then that would be good. 
<laughs> and we used to get that all the time when the kids were babies. Like, can you tell them apart? We're like, yes. Oh, How? Yeah. You're like, well, I look at them all day, every day, you know? Right. Well, Kyle, I have a question for you. Yeah. Is there a chance? Because every time they ask us which one's older, I always say, I think it's me. Because there is a fine chance that they may have switched us at some point. Oh, we haven't checked our, our footprint, uh, baby footprint, with, e- with each other's footprint. I don't think so. that the footprints, can, you can still you can tell. cross-check those. These are not good questions. I have a question for <laughs> okay, Kyle sure. that yeah. is more important. What is okay, that? go, John. No, it's, uh, do you, are you really good at telling the difference between other twins that you see? Oh, uh, boy, I'm that's not a even. good question. Uh, maybe. I am really good at it. Really? I can tell this very subtlest differences because I grew up with you guys. So you're always looking for that. Because you can, always, can pick yeah, out the subtleties real quick. Yeah, very much so. I just wondered if that was the same for That's you. That's on your, yeah, your perception level. That makes sense. If you were raised with that, like you've raised up twins, Kyle, he's grown up with them. Your perception level is going to be of that of exact copies. Right? Like slight tonal differences. You have to look for the, the variance. Yeah, and, I might be, yeah, I might have to start paying attention. I might be able, I might have a, a skill I didn't know I had. I, I remember no, <laughs> you know. we're different people. No. <laughs> we're when the di- twins were real little and they played baseball, they'd play on the same team. You wouldn't imagine the amount of times in the game where oh. the uh, manager would be like, no, number eight just batted like three kids ago. And we'd have to go, no, that's his identical brother. <laughs> oh, my god! <laughs> they would switch uniforms. Yeah. So there'd be days where Caleb's supposed to wear number eight and Jake is supposed to wear 13 and they would switch it. Because I just told ah, them to get dressed. devils. And they'd be up there devils. and they'd yeah. be like, next up to bat is Jacob. And I'd be like, with my wife, I'd be like, they don't know that that's Caleb. <laughs> so well, just go with it. My dad, uh, he taught our soccer team one year and he would go, good goal, Jeremy. And I go, it's me, dad. That never happened. That did happen. You never scored a goal. I remember. Oh! It, hurt me. it hurt me deeply. <laughs> oh, that was mean. <laughs> on your birthday. That's funny. And the twins, there's a lot of twins in your family. Yeah. Well, they say it skips a generation for us. It was our, um, our grandmother's sisters were identical twins. Okay. So my uh, wife, her brother and sister are twins. And then my second cousin had identical twins. So there's twins on both sides of our family. Okay. Wow. Yeah. So let me ask You're you this. Do, do your twin children, do they have a, a older brother? No, they have a younger brother. Okay. Oh, the inverse. Does he like them? Because our older brother had a hard time enjoying us <laughs> as we grew up. <laughs> I think you I mean, yeah. that's a personality thing, though. That's true. You're saying our personalities are bad. No, I'm just yeah, saying you guys exactly were extremely <laughs> energetic compared to, we're a I mean, obnoxious. they may not be, you know, all twins are not going to be the same personality. You were high energy. I was trying to balance yeah, it. We fed off each other. Yeah. All he's thinking about is all those times he could have left you alone at the park. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> I I man, they had never come back. I, this had been I so much like he better. he tried. <laughs> yeah, right. I didn't have control of the park situation. But. <laughs> for good reason, If I sir. could drive at the time, I'd be in some rest area. When I was a kid, I'd fall asleep in my twin side bed and wonder where my brother was. Aww. <laughs> Both twins odd at that. Aww. Partial twin stories. Well, you guys have been great. Yeah, thank you so much for coming on, guys. Yeah, this man, thanks for having us. It's great. We'll have to do it again. Yeah. Absolutely. I'd love to do some time, potentially, because uh, when we were going over your stories, there were so many stories that we had that I was like, man, this reminds me so much of one of our stories. It'd be cool to do like a corroboration story episode sometime in the future where it's like, boom, boom. It's like a story battle, but without the competition. Right. Just like this one relates to this. They pair off with each other. We definitely got to do when their book comes out. Oh, for sure. And like, let's yeah, do this again sometime. Story. You know, yeah. we could always meet up once a year oh, or something like that and do a show or, or whatever. Oh, that'd be fun. That'd be awesome. Yes. Well, thank you to you guys. This has it's been a real pleasure. You guys are super fun, super sweet. Can I say sweet? Sure. You guys are super nice, super nice guys. I knew you would be just from listening to you on the show. Like I just knew you guys were good guys. So good crossover. Yeah. Oh, thanks, man. It's fun. It's been a great time. You guys are so swell. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are awesome. Thank you so much. And uh, have a great rest of your year. Yeah. Yeah. Y'all yeah too. You too, man. It was really nice to meet you. And I'm glad yeah, we're, I'm glad we're friends. Absolutely. Feels good. Well, that was fun. It was fun. That was a great time. Kyle and Cam, wonderful guys. Great time. We hope you guys had as much fun as we did. This was an exceptional experience. I yeah, think. we'll definitely have to do yeah. it again. Make sure you guys go check them out. I'm sure that they have, I, they've started so much longer, so they have so much more to explore. So many episodes. But yeah, it was a wonderful time hanging out. Yeah, links to them in the show notes. Go check it out, expandedperspectives.com. Oh yeah, exciting news out there, by the way. Yeah, if you're not an expansion member yet, become an expansion member by going to beliefhole.com and clicking on the big red expansion button get double the episodes. We have over a hundred episodes there now, just like this full member episodes. And now, now with ad free 
main episodes. That's right. That will sync right with the expansion episodes. So the belief hole is sold out. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, we have to, we are becoming an ad friendly show. So if you want the full experience without any interruptions, now is the time to sign up as an expansion member. Yeah. Be a little bit patient. We're working on it. It's going to take a little bit of time to get through, but we promise it is coming. And we are going to be doing Discord in 2024. Yeah. Tons of great things coming up for members. So those are all going to be benefits for expansion members. And those of you who are not members, but still want to support the show, hit the like and subscribe. Like and subscribe. And, you know, support our sponsors because they it's support true. us. And uh, we really do appreciate it. We appreciate you guys out there helping us grow the whole. Yeah. Unfortunately, we have to make money like everyone else. So, yeah. but we are excited for the sponsors that we're bringing into the show because they're sponsors that we really believe in the products and services of and they believe in us yeah so go check them out definitely helps the show and that is all for today all right guys we'll, we'll see, see you see next, next time on believe hole